Sup dudes! We've got a lot to talk about. Conan Exiles has a big day coming up later this year with what is supposed to be its biggest update yet. Because we're putting a lot of work into what we're calling the 3.0 update, which is going to be massive. It will probably be one of, if not the biggest update we've done for Exiles. And a lot of us think that this is going to be the turning point for the game's health. At least as far as PvP is concerned, the biggest reasons the servers haven't been able to hold on to the surge of new players and past updates is primarily bugs, exploits, and cheaters. As far as the bugs go, most of them are fixed, and I never thought I'd be saying this, but most of the exploits are fixed too. It uh, took them five years, but hey, who's counting? On top of that, Funcom has gotten a lot better at banning people that cheat and exploit, and you know, sometimes the timing on those bans can be a little rough, but still, we're getting there. So while the game is by no means in a perfect state, it's never been in a better position to capitalize on an influx of new players. So I figured I'd use my modest platform to give some PvP feedback that I think will help with player retention. I know, a several hour long video for a game mode that has maybe 100 regular players, it's a little weird, but hey, somebody's gotta do it. A lot of it is just that every time I sit down and make content for this game, I bump into the same problem, so rather than grumble about it to myself, I'll share it so at least I can say I tried. But first, let's lay down some ground rules. All of the suggestions or requests I make in this video will be kept easy to implement and involve either changing stats or server sliders. We're keeping it simple in the hopes that some of these changes will actually be implemented rather than asking for total overhauls and having nothing happen. I will also be talking a lot about Rust in this video, but I want to clarify this right now in plain English. I do not want Conan to be like Rust. I'm going to leave that on the screen for emphasis. The two games offer such wildly different gaming experiences, I would barely even put them in the same category. I will, however, be using Rust as a tool to illustrate certain points, since Rust is at least genre adjacent and has been incredibly successful compared to Conan. So we should be learning what we can from Rust to help Conan succeed. Even with that said though, Conan offers something unique and I think it solves a number of problems that many other games fail to even address. There are more than a few comments on the Conan movie along the lines of, wait a minute, this is just a conflict between maybe 20 people? Yeah, this game does a great job of taking those smaller engagements and making them feel massive. And that kind of experience isn't exclusive to Zergs that spend months farming, it's considerably more attainable. Games like EVE Online have tons of videos espousing the potential for great storytelling, but what really happens for 99% of people is you get lost in the paperwork. You're guaranteed to be a cog in the machine, and the big happenings are few and far between. But in Conan, you could actually be a major player in your own story, not just a pawn in somebody else's. Even Rust won't offer you the same sense of scale that Conan does effortlessly. So my suggestions are designed to help Conan lean into its strengths and do what it does best, rather than emulate some other game on the market. But of course, uh, before we really get into it, let me just take a second to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Whether it's protecting your personal data or letting you watch your favorite content, Surfshark VPN is a little something for everybody. It encrypts your personal data to keep it safe from prying eyes, so you can browse the internet on public Wi-Fi without worrying about your data being stolen. And if you're looking to watch content that is otherwise restricted in your country, you can unblock this content by changing your IP to enjoy it anyways. So if you want to watch my solo raid video that is for some reason blocked in certain countries over a dubious copyright claim, with Surfshark you can continue to watch my mediocre content. But it also works for streaming services like Netflix if you're into that, which will give you access to a huge variety of otherwise unavailable content. Surfshark is incredibly easy to use and can be used on an unlimited number of devices, so you can stay safe whether you're at home or on the go and rest easy knowing that Surfshark has a strict no-logs policy, meaning it never collects your personal data. Surfshark has so many uses I couldn't ever pack it into just one tiny advert, so head over to Surfshark and use my promo code to get a whopping 83% off with three extra months free to try it out for yourself. The link is in the description. We're going to start off with an issue that sets up a lot of talking points at once. The drawbridge. I mentioned the value of drawbridges in my building tutorials because I'm not just going to give bad advice, but truthfully, drawbridges are the single greatest source of burnout for me in the game. The problem is that when drawbridges are used correctly in conjunction with a bubble, your base is functionally unraidable. Because drawbridges have 200,000 health and a hitbox that covers a lot of the building pieces around it, it's really easy to use it to soak up explosive damage. If it's placed in a tight enough choke point, like say at the keyhole, it's not actually possible to place enough explosives to break it in one blast. Meaning whoever is hiding behind it can just repair it to full health and you're back to square zero. And they can just keep doing this forever. If there's a god bubble on the base, you can't even use those to bypass the drawbridge. Essentially, once a large enough clan claims a location that supports this kind of building, the server reaches a solved state. Which is to say that the outcome is determined at that very moment. The minute a skilled clan has a drawbridge base, it's over. Everyone else on the server is just roleplaying as a thing to be raided at their leisure, because even if this clan fails every single raid, they can't suffer any consequences. 
This also applies to hanging bases, which use bubbles to block arrows, meaning they can't functionally be raided either. Though there are fewer places where this is possible, it's still a problem. The only way to raid these kinds of bases is to either wait for the owners to get bored and quit, or catch them while they're offline, neither of which are good options. The consequences of this go even further though. Solos and smaller clans obviously can't compete for the real estate to do stuff like this. Not that really anybody can, since the bases are unraidable, and pushing someone out of a building spot requires a full foundation wipe. Instead, they're pushed to adapt to a playstyle with no base and use chests with boosted decay timers to remain unfindable. There's people all over the viability spectrum, but make no mistake, at the absolute end of that spectrum, this is what you have on PvP servers. Unraidable clans and unfindable solos, and to a lesser extent smaller clans. This is peak performance, and it's terrible for the game. I'll say now that the nomadic choice is the lesser of these evils since at the very least, their security comes with quite a few noticeable drawbacks. But once a server reaches this end state, nothing is happening. They're stuck in a gridlock and the only way the stalemate breaks is if people burn out and quit. My playthrough on the European server is a perfect example of this. Admirals didn't have an unraidable base, but they had something pretty close since their bubble protected their anti-climb and they had claimed most of the good trebuchet locations. And because they were functionally unraidable for 99% of people, the outcome was predictable. The server was full at 40 out of 40 players for every raid window the entire time it was there, and it ultimately didn't matter. The server still felt dead. People who knew how the game worked took one look at the available bases to raid and got burnt out, and the people who didn't know any better got griefed. This kind of system enables the worst kinds of players to drive people off servers. But we're going to put this issue aside for a second, and you'll see why later. Keep it in the back of your mind though. We need to establish something before we can continue talking about Conan. This next bit is not a complaint. It's just a necessary piece of context that we have to concede before we can continue. Let's just admit it, okay? Conan Exiles is not a PvP game. Or at the very least, PvP is not the primary focus, and don't get me wrong, even without the focus on PvP I've had a lot of really amazing experiences in this game. I made a whole movie about a single playthrough I had, so clearly you can PvP in this game and thoroughly enjoy it, but that doesn't make it a PvP game. Let me use Rust as an example of an explicitly PvP game. From the minute you spawn in on the beach, you're engaged in PvP and stay that way at every stage of the game. If you're running monuments, you're fighting other players. Every piece of loot you obtain is for the expressed purpose of being used in PvP. You're running monuments for guns and for scraps so that you can research more guns to use in PvP, or you're running more dangerous monuments for a chance at explosives and raiding materials to, again, be used in PvP. If you kill someone that's been farming, you can actually carry their farm because there's no RPG stat system. If you kill a player who has a gun that you want, you can take it home and research it to be able to reproduce it, skipping large portions of the tech tree in the process. In other words, killing other players is a viable method of progression. Even a naked with good aim and a crossbow can make a play and start progressing. Every part of this game is directly and clearly designed to encourage and enable PvP. In fact, Rust doesn't even support the option to play in single player. If you're one of those people who regularly watches my stuff but has never actually played Conan, you'd probably be surprised to learn Conan has a story. It has voiced NPCs with some really impressive talent you'll likely recognize. What are you doing in this sandstorm? The mad fool replied. Um, your turn to talk, fool! Oh, look at this place! I haven't seen such a mess since the fall of Volusia! And look! The Archivist! It has full PvE dungeons, a main quest, and a way to win the game and escape the exiled lands. The journey steps that guide you through the game, the voiced staff of the triumvirate that gives you hints, and the structure of the progression system are designed to work with that core goal in mind, and as a result it is very much so a PvE game first and foremost. The journey steps will not steer you towards PvP, the dungeons won't, the NPCs won't, and the world design won't. It does obviously support PvP as an option. There are trebuchets and explosives and so on, which only really have functions within a PvP context, but it is not the main focus of the game. Put bluntly, PvP by itself is not a viable method of real progression outside of rare scenarios. Yeah, you can offline raid bases the minute you get access to a trebuchet. Maybe at level 30 you can start farming some explosives and go on a cheap raid for easy gains, but hopefully you can at least admit that there's a difference between a game that's designed for PvP and a game that contains PvP. Once again, we're not talking about isolated experiences, we're talking about the way the underlying systems encourage and direct gameplay. And to be abundantly clear, I'm not saying that we should emulate Rust here, I'm just using it to illustrate the point. The amount of resources it would take to completely overhaul the game into a primarily PvP driven experience is unrealistic, but if we're able to admit that it isn't a PvP game, if we make that concession, we can find reasonable ways to improve the experience for everybody. 
simplifying certain recipes and reducing barriers to entry becomes so much easier to argue for when we can just admit that the game doesn't properly facilitate PvP on a fundamental level. We'll be revisiting the issue throughout the video, so I'll leave that there, but if you're finding yourself lost or disagreeing with me, just sit tight, I'm gonna win you over by the end. So let's pivot to the Sifter review I put out way back when. I took that video down for a variety of reasons, chiefly that after the rework, I really like Sifter and actually prefer it to the original map, so I didn't want to leave a whole lot of outdated information up and cause confusion. Also, the, uh, the video contained an immense amount of copyrighted music. But I talked about a few things in that video that I think are still relevant. For some context, back in the day, the only way to get good thralls on Sifter was to summon them at the Lay Shrines. The obvious problem being that obtaining thralls, which were necessary for efficient crafting at the time, was locked behind your ability to fight the entire server, since summoning a large surge meant marking your location on the map, letting everybody know what you were doing and where. This immediately boxed 99% of people out of becoming competitive, since only clans with enough people and experience would even try. And adding mechanics that favor large group play in a game where the servers only hold 40 people is a really bad idea. This is an issue that's going to be cropping up a lot in this video. We won't dwell on the particulars of the surges, because that issue has been addressed with Sifter's rework. Thrall camps have been added, and the economy update takes a lot of the burden of crafter thralls and puts them onto benches. But there's a core problem underneath all that, which I think still needs addressing, which is that the barrier to entry for PvP is so high, it prices out large portions of the player base from the core experience, whether that's intentional or not. The problem comes in both quantity and complexity. Think about all the stuff you need for PvP. Epic flawless gear, specific weapons and armor recipes, crafter thralls to make high stat items, the best aloe potions and craft, horses, high quality well -built food, horse armor for the horses, is a massive time star metal for weapons poisons and tools, of all varieties, combat thralls, preferably mass, already poison leveled arrows, materials for siege bases and trebuchets, full spread of buffs using flowers from armor specifically for thralls, end game tools, upgraded crafting benches which by themselves will cost a large amount crafter of thralls for recipes and gear. <sighs> the list goes on. Not to mention that for every one of those categories you'll need spares, since if you die with your only set of gear on you, you're out of the fight so multiply everything by however much you want. So the grocery list is long, but what makes it deadly isn't just the quantity, it's the complexity. Because each part of that list is a list in and of itself. The recipes are very bloated. Let's use pork feast as an example. These are not the best in slot food items. They're widely considered a more budget alternative to religious feasts. Pork feasts require dried berries, which are berries that have to be dried, obviously. Pork that is already cooked and mead, which requires glass flasks filled with water, which are then cooked to purify them, mixed with fiber, honey obtained passively for beehives, and leavening agent, which has to be farmed directly. Berries and leavening agent can only be obtained in certain parts of the map, and glass flasks are either crafted out of crystal, which is itself only found in certain parts of the map, or by buying flasks after taking a trip to an NPC city using silver, which is also only obtained in certain parts of the map. So altogether, you need to travel all over the map to obtain a variety of disparate ingredients, wait for multiple separate crafting windows to dry the berries, craft or buy the flask, purify the water, cook the pork, and ferment the mead, before finally combining it all into a singular unit of food that ultimately doesn't even heal all that much anyways. And to be fair, with some game knowledge, this does get a lot easier. I farm my hides in the sacred grove and there's pigs in there, so I can get my pork while I farm my hides. Berries grow on most rivers, so if I'm grabbing crystal for bombs, I can bring a sickle and get berries that way. But you've still got multiple crafting windows and extra farming trips to do, even if you farm as efficiently as possible. And if you're using thralls to carry your farm, you might not have the inventory slots to even make those detours. Essentially, every category of thing you need for PvP is a multi-step journey, and if you don't have whatever it is and your enemy does, chances are you just lose. Oh, what's the matter? No poisons? No antidotes? No horse? No epic gear? No feasts? Because all of these things are so impactful in PvP, they each operate like separate gear checks. So missing even a single thing puts you at a huge disadvantage and feels really unsatisfying. You lost your fight because item 8 on your 54 point list was missing from your inventory and obtaining it's going to take you another several hours. In my one raid I did in my solo playthrough, you can see the difference in gear. In normal gear, a single left click did over half my health and damage. But obtaining more epic gear would require getting more silk, more thick hide, more alchemical base, which would require gold and silver and ichor, and you get the idea. Granted, I was also strapped for time given how those events played out, but it still illustrates the point. Now remember the drawbridge problem we brought up in the beginning. Imagine the entire time you're off chasing a seemingly infinite amount of things to do on your to-do list. And all the while, in the back of your mind, you know your only real targets on the server are potentially unraidable. So not only is it all time-consuming, it's also pointless. You could obtain everything you need and find there's nothing you can do anyways. You can see how this can really start to lead to some insane burnout in players. When Sipta came out and I did my review, I made the argument that I didn't really think it was a PvP map, but I think I misrepresented the problem, because clearly a lot of it was designed to encourage PvP. 
The center of the map is dense with resources, the summoning surges mark your location and invited competition. But the reason that neither of those things really worked is because you can't have players compete over resources when the prerequisite for competition requires having already gotten those resources. Meanwhile, that exact setup can work in a game like Rust because Rust is built differently. You can expect players to compete over airdrops and monuments and special encounters because everyone has the potential to come out on top regardless of how prepared they are. Any naked with a bow or an Ioka pistol could potentially make a play, however unlikely. In Conan, there's so many gear checks and prerequisites, there's just no real equivalent. You're never going to have a level 1 naked player make a play on a fully armored and buffed level 60 player. So having people fight to make progress or obtain necessary resources just means new players and smaller clans won't make progress. And if you can't make progress, you can't play. And so the natural end game of this would be empty servers, which is exactly what we saw. It's like I said earlier, the game just isn't designed for PvP on a fundamental level, at least not in that way. And to be clear, being grindy by itself isn't the problem. One of the reasons I prefer Conan and find it hard to take Rust seriously is because of how transient Rust is. Building a base takes very little time, endgame doesn't really mean that much, servers wipe every week and there's always another one around the corner so getting wiped doesn't matter. It kind of makes the game feel cheap or hollow, nothing really matters. I really like that in Conan, raiding somebody actually means something. Bases matter because they take time and thought to construct. Every raid is unique, depending on how things are put together, and conflicts usually last longer than just a 10 minute throwaway raid. As I've shown, sometimes you can get some really lengthy campaigns. So it's not that the system needs to be less grindy as a rule, it just needs to be streamlined so it doesn't get in the way of PvP so much. The minimum amount of time to get started is prohibitively high for Conan, and that's for skilled players who know all the shortcuts and farming routes and so on. For new players, getting a handle on the game can feel impossible. So let's see what we can do to streamline things. Let's start with the drawbridges, since that's easy enough. They just need to have their health reduced. The general philosophy around building health is relatively consistent with entryways having way less health than walls and foundations, which makes sense. It allows you to build your base in a way that directs an incoming attack, and attackers can either choose to save on explosives by going through the doors, or potentially make a safer entry at the cost of more explosives by going through walls. Drawbridges, for some reason, are the exception in that they have 200,000 health for some reason. Maybe the assumption is that drawbridges are harder to place, so you'll only have one or two, so it's okay for them to be strong, but it only takes one to make a base functionally unraidable, and there's no real reason for that. Keep in mind, there's still usually an entire honeycomb base built around these drawbridges, so it's not like these bases would suddenly become unviable without them. It would just make it so that instead of being unraidable, you have a chance, however small it may be. I understand sometimes solos rely on these to survive larger raids, but we have to understand that this does way more harm than good. Of course, this would only fix drawbridge choke points. Hanging bases with bubbles on them would still be functionally unraidable. For those of you that aren't familiar, a hanging base is built into the ceiling of a pre-existing structure high enough that the splash damage of bombs either doesn't hit it or barely hits it, and it'll have a god bubble on top which will block people from using arrows. It goes without saying that we're going to have a much longer section about building adjustments later, gods and bubbles, because spoiler alert, it's a balancing nightmare. But I've spent a lot of time trying to think of a solution for this that doesn't involve too many mechanics reworks. And the two answers I have both had some potential downsides, so this is far from a solution. Firstly, and this would be the easiest and messiest fix, is to either expand the blast radius on explosives or reduce the damage fall off at further distances. As it is, most hanging bases are just low enough to be grazed by explosives, but because the damage dealt at this distance is so much lower, it takes an unreasonable amount of explosives to break even a single building piece, which is impossible to do under duress. Increasing the blast radius would make this less of an issue at the cost of making explosives even more devastating in raids. If it's possible, maybe just extend the blast cone vertically instead of universally. The second option I came up with involves bringing back a lesser used mechanic, the humble orb. Lost in the dustbins of time, this could be the solution we need. Firstly, make it so that god bubbles no longer block orbs. Then adjust the demon fire orb recipe to require dragon powder, or make a new kind of orb. Adjust their damage so that they're closer to an explosive jar, and then make it so that you can throw them just a little bit farther. By enabling orbs as a raiding tool that can bypass bubbles, hanging bases become raidable again with minimal impact on the rest of the raiding meta. Pillar bases and most bases that rely on limiting arrows would not be made any weaker since you can only throw an orb so far. And if you have to be in throwing distance to use an orb, it doesn't make any other kind of base any weaker either. It really only enables the rating of hanging bases. Granted, 
Being able to throw an explosive instead of having to place one carries significant implications, so they'd have to be made heavier to compensate and prevent people from carrying around tons and tons of explosives at no cost. Additionally, traditional ceiling bases that aren't unraidable would be a lot more vulnerable by making vertical raids easier, and that's just an unfortunate casualty of a change like this. But if the choice is having unraidable bases or nerfing a few locations unintentionally, the choice is pretty simple. Again, neither option is really perfect. The only way to really solve this problem would be to overhaul the bubble mechanic, which is frankly outside the scope of this video. But if nothing is done, hanging bases can and will continue to kill servers. And really, demon fire orbs don't have much of another function beyond maybe sometimes being used for star metal. And we're talking about unraidable bases here. A change has to be made. Moving on, streamlining the PvP prerequisites is a bit trickier than just adjusting a slider. So I'm just going to list off a number of things that I think should be changed to help the overall experience. Starting with poisons. I gotta be honest with you, if poison as a mechanic was removed from the game, I would not lose any sleep over it. Poisons trivialize PvE and PvP, and dying to poison is always unsatisfying. It's just not a fun mechanic to play around. The problem stems from how poisons are dealt with. You can kill a single locust and get over 20 poisons from it, but antidotes are a different story. The most reliable way to farm up antidotes is to harvest hearts and sacrifice them individually on a set altar. So for every one locust your enemy kills, you have to farm up 20 individual human beings to counter it, which obviously takes way more time. I was actually one of the few PvPers that was really okay with the Ambrosia nerf when it rolled out. Not because I thought Ambrosias were overpowered, but because we already have to farm antidotes one at a time, so farming Ambrosias one at a time on top of that was just ridiculous. The role that Ambrosias played in PvP needed to be satisfied with something more attainable, which we'll get to. But put simply, players need better answers for poisons. You can technically craft violet curatives from snake lands, but snakes aren't super common and the harvesting rate is terrible. Either curatives need to be made cheaper, or snakes have to give more glands. The second survival perk is pretty universally considered worthless. I think it should be reworked to give some kind of poison resistance. Sure, 20 points isn't a huge investment for either immunity or resistance, but you have to remember in PvP your points are stretched pretty thin. 20 points is nothing to sneeze at, and poison is just not a fun mechanic to play around. I would genuinely be okay with it just giving a flat immunity if I'm being honest. Generally speaking, I like that healing has been shifted onto potions to make healing a more deliberate act. You can't just cheese your way through every fight with a stack of food and herbal tea. You have to know when you can heal to take that risk. That said, the effort to reward ratio for foods is way off. You have to understand, PvPers already have their time being pulled in a million different directions. So if a food item requires even just a moderate amount of time, that should be rewarded appropriately. In the example of the pork feasts, none of those ingredients are really hard to obtain. It's just that because there are so many different ingredients from all over the place, it becomes time consuming even if it isn't challenging. I'd like to see healing from all foods increased on the lower end of the spectrum so players don't feel like they have to devote hours a day into just farming up foods. As it is now, huge portions of the available foods hardly heal for anything at all, and then you just get this sudden spike when you consider feasts. I think any food item that requires multiple crafting stages, specialty recipes, or a variety of ingredients needs to be buffed. Furthermore, unlocking the stove should grant you the herbal tea recipe, and the healing from herbal tea should be buffed a bit, so that it can take the place of the old ambrosia buff. You can make it more expensive as a trade-off, but something has to fill that role while still being obtainable. When the food and potion change went live, Ambrosias actually came with a little healing burst when consumed, which is really nice for PvP. Without any healing buffer beyond potions, combat is often decided by who lands that first shot. By giving players a little bit of healing, combat mistakes were a little bit less punishing. And this is what I'm aiming for from certain foods without reverting all the way back to when you could heal infinitely off a stack of haunted tea and every fight lasted for years. Buffing up food just a little bit fills the void left by Ambrosia and makes PvP and combat in general feel a lot smoother. And in what might be a controversial take, I think purified water needs to just be removed as a step. I can drink water straight out of the swampy jungle without any health effects. Having to purify water before so many recipes adds another unnecessary crafting window onto recipes that are already super time consuming. For recipes like Pork Feast, you'd only be reducing the number of crafting windows by one. You'd still have to dry the berries, craft the mead, cook the pork, and combine them all. It would just help to reduce some of the tedium. And speaking of aloe and herbal tea, farming should be sustainable. Way back in the day, the explanation was that the developers didn't want players to make a single farming trip and be done with it, sitting comfortably in their bases without ever having to travel. And believe me, I agree a lot with that sentiment, especially with how common server stagnation is. But I think the game has changed a lot since those conclusions were reached. These days, you've got so many new endgame grinds for PvP with Eldarium and recipes and sigils. 
I don't think it'd be an unreasonable concession to just let players renewably farm crops. It doesn't even have to be super efficient either. The point is it would alleviate some of the traveling you'd have to do to stay viable, especially now that aloe is in such high demand. It's worth keeping in mind that the real grind for good aloe potions lies in the alchemical base, which was never a factor in healing before. So it's not like it's going to make the game too easy by enabling aloe farming. Simplifying the PvP grind also means opening up endgame alternatives. Dragonhide armor is obtainable right in the center of the map, requires fairly easy to obtain components, and has some of the best stats for PvP. This is exactly what the game needs more of, giving the players the tools they need to compete without making them jump through hoops for it. And to that end, I think Serpentman weapons need a revisit. I'm not actually too clear on why they got nerfed in the first place, but especially now that Alchemical Base is being used in more recipes, I think it's time these got rebuffed. Because players can obtain the recipe on their own and it doesn't require a specialty material like Star Metal, it'll give players a more reliable source of endgame weapons. It's almost a running joke on my channel, but getting star metal that isn't bugged can be extremely rare. And if your effectiveness in PvP is locked behind a random weather event, it can waste a lot of your valuable time. Like I said, alchemical base is used now more than ever. Quality aloe potions require it, and since the Dagon fish traps got nerfed, people are using standard buff potions instead, which also require alchemical base. So I think it's a fair trade-off for Serpentman weapons to be brought on par with Star Metal, given that one of their key ingredients is in such high demand everywhere else. And honestly, I just like the way they look. The thralls have always been a contentious issue for PvPers. I actually like the thrall mechanic. I've been at a lot of raids, both offensively and defensively, where I consider the thralls to have been an objective improvement to the experience. It's just a fun idea to have a large castle filled with an army to protect your stuff. They also recently had their damage to players cut in half, which was a huge step in the right direction. My only issue with Thralls as they are now is really... Teemos. My opinion on this has changed a lot since he was added, since as a solo it was kinda nice to just grab a Thrall and roll, but it's just too much. When a Thrall is routinely achieving 13,000 or more health when the average player only has around 500, it's a lot to handle. Especially since Thralls can get pretty considerable poison and bleed resistance from survival perks, so cheesing them is harder than ever. Teemos has a way of rendering every other Thrall obsolete, which makes the game feel less interesting. I personally prefer Relic Hunters myself, but there are people that love Berserkers, people that swear by Leon Fighters, and there's almost always somebody farming Volcano Fighters. A nerf to Teemos would bring all of these back into the game. Without Teemos, Thrall strength in general goes down too since other endgame Thralls tend to level slower, so their overall strength is much lower on average, which is good for PvP. I like Thralls, I just don't think that they should be hitting 5 digit health pools. He's got some of the highest scaling, some of the best damage multipliers, and he levels faster than any other in-game Thrall? That's a little overloaded. It also cheapens the value of actually catching a real Purge Thrall when you can just print them out on demand. Just make him unthrallable and call it a day. A Sipta brings a lot of interesting problems into the mix. For the most part, like I said earlier, I really like the way Sipta wound up. The recurring issue throughout the video, though, is that the gap between the haves and have-nots is just too large. Think back on that long laundry list of stuff you need for PvP. Now go ahead and add sigils, Eldarium, and dungeon recipes to that. Many of the new additions in Sipta take the existing problems and make them worse. If you thought fighting somebody with better gear, food, potions, buffs, thralls, and so on was bad, fighting somebody with a full spread of sigils when you have none genuinely feels like you're fighting against a hacker. They run farther, use less stamina, are immune to poison, resistant to bleeds, climb longer, and so on and so forth. It's incredibly oppressive. In the right kind of game, a series of buffs that you drop on death could have been a really fun addition, but I don't think it works for Conan. And even if you do manage to kill someone and they're supposed to drop their sigils, there's a sigil that prevents them from dropping sigils on death, which makes the entire exercise pointless. I doubt that removing sigils is on the table. I will say that I think that's the proper move. I don't think Conan needs sigils, and encouraging people to stockpile one-time drops out of every vault on top of their usual grind is just too much especially when a lot of the existing game needs a lot of balancing passes. But at the very least, the sigil that prevents the loss of sigils on death needs to be reworked. If you manage to kill someone when they have every advantage over you, they should lose that advantage. Either make it a duplicate farming sigil, or just rework it into something else. Uh, speaking of the farming sigil, the sigil of the gremlin if I'm not mistaken, this should not increase the amount of favor you get from harvesting people. Gods are already a very tough mechanic to argue for. Making the favor farm even easier just exacerbates the issue. We'll talk about them later, but gods are incredibly dangerous weapons. They could be made three times as expensive as they are now, and they would still be raid-defining weapons. Making them any easier to get is a mistake. Generally speaking, most of the dungeon recipes are alright. They're strong, absolutely, but the only dungeon weapons that really stick out as being bad for gameplay are the Phyroxic weapons. 
We've already covered the fact that Poison as a mechanic really sucks to play against, but at least back in the day, that seemed to be understood. The only way to have permanently poisoned weapons before was to unlock venom infused weapons. And the developers seemed to understand that permanent poison was incredibly powerful, so not only did you have to get them through RNG, but their stats were always measurably lower than regular weapons. They also required Sand Beast Bio Clans and Fragments of Power, which limited the amount of venom weapons you could reasonably craft. Then comes along Feroxic weapons, which are incredibly cheap by comparison and also have better stats than most endgame weapons, especially after the economy update. They're just way, way too strong and everybody knows it. A pair of Feroxic daggers will win you almost any fight in the game, and it trivializes every single bit of PvE there is. A Feroxic weapon should have their strength brought below Venom weapons. They're too easy to craft for how strong they are, and even if better access to antidotes were made available, I stand by my original point about poison. It's not a fun mechanic to play with. These same complaints apply to a lesser extent to the Spear of Zath. If there's any lesson to be learned here, it's that if a weapon is going to be permanently poisoned, it has to be hard to craft or else it becomes the meta. Find a way to reel in the power or add in a crafting requirement that makes sense. The aspect of the Demon Helm is another tricky to balance item. On the one hand, I like the build opportunities it makes possible. In fact, the Sifted Gear in general opens up a lot of fun opportunities for unique builds. This helmet, though, is extremely good, good enough to be best in slot for anybody that has access to it. When used with light armor, you have almost as much damage reduction as a full set of heavy armor, but its only downside is that it doesn't give a bonus to stats, something that's actually easily mitigated by other Sipta gear. That's not to say that I want this helmet removed, but this one item existing just further invalidates medium and heavy armor as options. It's hard enough to justify heavy and even medium given their increased stamina costs, but when you can have the same security at no cost, it's a done deal. I'd like to see the aspect of the demon helmet made considerably more heavy. That way, if you choose to use this helmet, you have to sacrifice somewhere else, whether that's stamina regen or the amount of gear and explosives you can carry. As it is, it's a no-brainer option since with the right armor, thrall, and kit, it hardly weighs anything for what it gives you. Just make it so that using this helmet is an actual choice with real negatives instead of just being the best-in-slot option for all cases. Solving the problem of stagnant servers is a bit more complicated than just streamlining some farming. The big problem PvP servers have is that they're generally pretty empty. This screenshot was taken on a Friday night just recently, so if I want to play on a North American server with more than 20 people online during East Coast prime time, I've only got a choice between two servers that aren't even full, and outside of the top three, the majority of servers have single digit populations. Some lower than five at a time. And while everyone swears EU is so much better, and technically it is, if we're being fair, it's not by much. With this screenshot taken at around 5pm on a Saturday, German time. As I've shown on this channel, this game has the potential to offer really amazing experiences. So if the average player is choosing to either quit or not participate, it stands to reason that there's a problem with achieving those experiences. Clearly something's not working. And to fix the problem, we need to make sure of two things. Firstly, victory has to be possible in the first place. I'm referring strictly to things like unraidable hanging bases when I say that, and I think that's pretty obvious. If it literally isn't possible to defeat your enemy, there's no point in trying, so nerfing drawbridges and finding some kind of solution for bubbles is crucial. The second thing we need to make sure of is that victory, or at least the fun attempted at victory, is reasonably attainable, and that's the tricky part. Nobody wants to join a server and roleplay as a thing to be raided for somebody else's amusement. People want a shot at the top, or at the very least a good time with people around their power level. If people think that's out of reach or requires an inhuman time investment, they'll just go play something more consistent. In fact, consistent is the right word for it, and it segues into the bigger conversation. Let's zoom out for a minute. Like, really zoom out. Okay, maybe, maybe not that far. We need to talk about Conan's place in the market and full loot PvP games in general. There's a general perception that full loot hardcore PvP games can't succeed. Watching videos on the subject and leafing through their comment sections gives you a pretty grim idea of what the genre is capable of. Most people seem to think that the average hardcore PvP fan just wants to grieve without consequence. And for what it's worth, people like that, using the term people very loosely here, do exist. But these people are not the majority, or even a sizable portion of the player base. For every one of these kinds of players, there's 80 normal players just trying to have a good time. There's this impression that the average PvPer is some maladjusted social reject that only has fun putting others down. But for those of you that watched the movie I made about that one legendary Conan playthrough, almost everybody on our team was either married or about to be. Jumbi was wrapping up medical school and I was sinking 60 to 70 hours a week into my job. A few of our clanmates had to tap out because they were having children. 
you'd be surprised to learn how many amazing, productive, well-adjusted, normal people I've met in these allegedly irredeemable PvP games. The truth is that normal people make up the majority of every player base, but if the game's design caters to that toxic minority, all the normal people leave, which only cements the illusion that this is all these games are good for. But this is partly why I spent so much time faithfully recreating the events in the Conan movie, because for people like me, games like Conan offer experiences you can't get anywhere else. This genre is so much more than just an outlet for losers to bully strangers on the internet. One of the most consistent complaints I hear about full loop PvP games is that they're not fair or balanced. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? Asymmetry is an integral part of the formula. In games where everything is strictly fair, everything starts to feel kind of meaningless and sterile. Whether or not you win or lose feels like it's determined more by the matchmaking algorithm rather than anybody's individual skill. It has a way of feeling fake or shallow. For people like me, having so much skin in the game is crucial. It makes everything feel real and dangerous. You can't get the kinds of experiences I've had in Conan without having all the pitfalls of full loop PvP. The incredible upsets, the huge gains, making that one play that brings you all those riches. When you do finally overcome that great obstacle and achieve victory, it's a real triumph. And yeah, sometimes that means you get screwed, but that's all part of the fun. You have to take the good with the bad, and as long as things are handled correctly, it will balance out in the end. And that's the clincher. If things are handled correctly. In my opinion, the PvP games that fail have a tendency to cater to the kinds of players that kill their own games, rather than leaning into what the genre is capable of. They don't have quality of life features because those are, quote, Care Bear features that aren't hardcore enough. Of course, these hardcore players are usually the biggest cowards in their respective games. When they're winning, they want the game to be as hardcore as possible so they can gank noobs until they quit. But the minute they don't have the advantage, they're the first people to quit and switch servers or resort to cheating to maintain their advantage. It's amazing how easy it is to dominate a server and be alpha when you play like absolute pussies, but I digress. People who believe full loot PvP games can't succeed unfortunately have a lot of examples to support that claim. I'm not attacking anybody featured in this video, and to be fair, their examples are all MMOs which are genre adjacent but not quite the same as Conan. But if the theory states that all swans are white, you only need to find one black swan to disprove the theory. And there's one game in particular that has only grown over the years and now consistently places in the top 10 games played on Steam for years at a time. So if we really want to talk about full loop PvP games, we need to see what this one did right before we can understand what Conan might be doing wrong. Rust has a reputation for having a fairly toxic player base, but I'd argue that Rust does a better job at mitigating its toxic elements than most. Yes, it's still full loop PvP. You can get killed at spawn, you can get raided 24-7, and 9 times out of 10 when you get wiped, you'll be offline. It's everything that's supposed to kill a game, and yet it still has one of the healthiest player bases of the genre. It goes back to the word consistency, which I brought up earlier. Rust is an incredibly consistent game, because it has an incredibly low barrier to entry. It's a shooter, so if you've played shooters before, it's easy enough to pick up and play. Yeah, there's spray patterns that make a big difference later on, but you're not learning an entirely new skill set here, you're just adapting. You'll get kill potential pretty early on. Anybody with good aim and a bow or a crossbow can make a play and make huge leaps in technology. A well-placed Yoka shot will kill just about anybody it hits, if you can get in close enough. And getting better gear only involves running a few monuments with elite crates or getting a lucky airdrop or two. Building a base is also pretty easy. The mechanics are straightforward, upgrading a wall means you've actually really increased your survivability, and obtaining the resources for a modest home doesn't take very long at all. The consequence of it all is that it's much easier to get something out of Rust compared to Conan. And because there's less hassle getting started, it's much easier to recover for being white. Which is also why the 24-7 raid scheme doesn't chase off nearly as many players as you might think. Additionally, because the gameplay starts immediately, you're much more likely to have fun before getting wiped. The minute you spawn in, you can head to a gas station or some early monument and start having the rust experience that's advertised on the box, so to speak. So if you spend all day making games, having fun, learning blueprints and so on, and then you log in the next day to see you got wiped, well, you still had fun that entire previous day. And you know starting over won't take long, so you pull up the server list and get back in there. I've put a few hundred hours into Rust so far, and after all the horror stories I've heard about it, I was actually pretty surprised at how forgiving and, dare I say, casual it feels when compared to Conan. I genuinely consider Rust to be a stress-free game by comparison, which might take some explaining. If Rust is easy to get into, Conan is the opposite. Even for skilled and knowledgeable players, there's a long time investment period of getting set up. Getting your recipes, farming a base, getting explosives, remember that huge list of things you need? And the thing is that most of that is completely separate from whatever experience you associate with Conan. You're probably not going to be fighting anybody, probably not going to go on any raids, it's just sticking your head down and farming it out and getting to the end game. 
And that's if you know what you're doing. For new players, the entire combat and building system takes a lot of time to learn on their own. Building a viable base and figuring out how to get good at combat takes some serious time. The only combat system that's like Conan's is maybe Dark Souls, but outside of stamina management, you'll still need to learn every weapon's attack patterns, along with their hyper armor windows, your healing options, and so on. Thankfully, there are raid windows that at least protect you while you're getting situated, but this is half the reason why being offline in Conan is so much more devastating. If you spend a week farming up and get offline, it's not like you spent that whole week having fun and going on raids and doing PvP, you spent that whole week grinding, so you don't really have anything to show for it. Basically, a Conan playthrough has long periods of downtime, followed by huge payoffs which, to be fair, if they happen, they can make up for all that downtime. But if you get offline, or something goes wrong, or a clan quits, it's just downtime all the time. Because there's no consistency in what you get out of the playthrough, it's entirely possible to not have any payoffs at all. My last solo series is a great example of this. I was on that server for almost 5 weeks, putting tons of hours a week into just gathering footage and grinding. And I only walked away with one half of a raid as all of the PvP that I got for that effort. That's not something that should ever happen, especially in a game that advertises PvP. You can't always make things happen in a game like this, and I get that. But for that amount of time and effort, the total lack of payoff is insane. Because there's so many mechanics that get in the way of smooth gameplay, very little was happening on that server at all, and players were burning out faster than they were showing up. Conan is a slow burn game, and I like that about it. But we still need to hit a sweet spot between being super approachable and being a waste of time. So am I saying that we need to make Conan more casual? I mean, sure if you want to put it that way, but I'll remind everybody that the PvP servers back in the day used to have their gathering and experience rates doubled, and the servers were a lot healthier back then. I don't think that's a coincidence. And to be fair, some smaller changes have been made over the years that somewhat mitigate having our farming rates cut in half. Brimstone was adjusted to give a lot more per harvest so you almost get about as much as you did before. And the reinforcement recipe was given to tier 3 and 4 blacksmiths instead of just purge blacksmiths, so making steel reinforcements is a lot easier. But when you take a look at everything you need in PvP, I don't think that's nearly enough to mitigate the extreme increase in time required to become viable. The gathering and experience rates need to be doubled. They were double for a reason. I know this makes balancing the game more difficult between the game modes, but 1x is just not enough to facilitate healthy PvP, and the proof is in the numbers. Improving the rates makes the initial setup much easier and makes rebounding from a raid that much more forgiving. As it is now, most people understandably quit after being raided. I mentioned earlier that server stagnation can be fixed by lowering the barrier to entry, but it can also be helped by limiting the maximum amount of power that people have to compete with. Let's go back to Rust for a sec. Rust doesn't really have the problem of server stagnation for a variety of reasons. Firstly, a server can have hundreds of people online. Sure, a large group might set up right next to you, but even just moving a few squares away can be enough to avoid any headaches because there's just so much going on. And if a clan really becomes insurmountable, the servers wipe every week or every month depending on which one you're on. So they're never on top forever and there's always another server around the corner. Nobody obtains impossible levels of strength forever, it's all transient. This has a way of naturally curbing the power of zergs, or at least giving you the options to avoid them. And we'll talk about server wipes later because, spoiler alert, none of the changes in this video are going to matter without at least one wipe for the official servers. But we can identify one other problem very easily here. In Rust, the servers hold hundreds of people, and the maximum group size is 10. Yeah, you can share codes and whatnot, but we're talking about basic groups here. In Conan, the servers hold 40 people, and the maximum group size is also 10. Our servers are one tenth the size, but our groups are the same. Is it any wonder our servers stagnate so often? If you've got a full clan of 10 people that are good at the game, know what they're doing, and play frequently, on a server that never wipes where they can become infinitely entrenched, dislodging a group like this is almost impossible, especially if they have an unrateable base, which goes without saying. The fact that you can have a quarter of a server's maximum population in a single clan is just crazy to me. And if we're being fair, if you have 10 active players, you've got a much larger portion of the server's active player base than 25%, since servers are rarely actually full at 40 players. The amount of clans that can reasonably contest this kind of power is, by default, a tiny portion of the player base, which translates into there being effectively no competition on most servers, which means they die. Most people aren't going to be able to wrestle up an equally powerful and sweaty 10-man clan to fight them off, which, again, in the current game, if they're in an unrateable base, might just be impossible anyways. But fixing this should actually be pretty easy. One of Conan's strengths is that it can take smaller conflicts and make them feel much larger. Because of how raiding and building works, every conflict feels huge, even if it's just a neighborly dispute between some smaller clans. There's a perception among some people that in order for a conflict to feel epic it needs to be big, which means lots of people. And this just isn't true. 
Conan doesn't need that kind of scale to feel epic. Its presentation and mechanics already achieve this. So with this in mind, Clan should be no larger than six people. It's plenty large enough to accommodate a decent group of friends without being so large that it kills a server just by existing. And with a maximum clan size of six, you could fit up to six full clans on a server at a time with room to spare. The more clans there are, the more competition and the less likely servers are to be strangled to death by one monolithic clan of poop suckers. Like I said earlier, this game offers some amazing experiences, and the way I see it, if people believe it's possible to make moves on a PvP server, they will. And the only reason they wouldn't is because they believe it's impossible. So, shrinking clan sizes is a good step towards making PvP possible and consistent. Additionally, with more clans farming and preparing for war, you're more likely to encounter players in the wild, making servers feel more lively and active. It's a flat improvement to the experience. And to be extremely clear here, I'm not saying that large clans or experienced clans should not be powerful or that they should be punished for existing. We're just discussing how much power a clan should be allowed to have before it starts to interfere with server health. Put simply, clans cannot be allowed to reliably reach power levels that make them impossible to deal with or else contesting a server becomes unrealistic. Increasing the gathering rates and reducing overall clan sizes are two steps towards solving that. Reducing clan power is important for another reason, since once clans have their maximal power made reasonable, we can comfortably start to address other long-standing issues. Gods, for example, have always been a really tough sell. It may come as a surprise to some of you that I'm not actually super happy about where gods currently are, given how much I've used them in the past. In a game where clans are allowed to take up over a quarter of the active players on a server and bases consist of thousands of building pieces, there's a need for there to be a mechanic that removes large numbers of pieces in a short time. If it works as it's supposed to, it can keep server turnover healthy by preventing clans from becoming untouchable. Gods are also an important force equalizer that allows smaller clans and even solos to potentially become very dangerous, even while extremely outnumbered. Nerfing or removing gods when you're dealing with 10-man groups sinking 80 hours a week into the game would be a straight buff to the exact kinds of people that don't really need it. But, let's say hypothetically the game is made more accessible, and clans aren't allowed to be that powerful or large. Well, now we can start to talk about adjusting the god mechanic because even I can see that gods as they are have just as many downsides as positives, if not more. The mere thought of even having to farm up a bubble every other day causes many players to burn out immediately, myself included. It's one of the biggest reasons I've never bothered with pillar bases or bases in general if I can help it. Having a gigantic and wildly expensive base wiped in the span of 60 seconds isn't satisfying, and players are extremely unlikely to rebuild when they've had two weeks worth of work deleted in a single minute with very little counterplay. Worse still, because bubbles are even easier to maintain for larger clans, instead of behaving as force equalizers that can rein in larger groups, it's much more common to see larger clans just running around wiping sandstone bases with gods just because they can, while being effectively immune to it themselves. But fixing the problem is tricky though, because with the building system being the way that it is, there does need to be something that fulfills the role of a god in the raiding ecosystem. And I need to stress that if clans don't have their power restricted in any way, nerfing gods will only serve to worsen the state of most servers. Bombing your way through a fully stacked crevice base manned by 10 people at all hours is impossible for the vast majority of people playing the game. Like it or not, gods are necessary for dealing with certain base designs and locations. And without that option, those so-called alphas would just get to kill servers even easier. But I do have a few ideas though. Firstly, gods should require a named priest. It always struck me as really weird that you only need a tier 3 priest to invoke the most powerful part of any religion. Because named priests are considerably more rare, this would immediately reduce the amount of gods being thrown around. And because you'd only need a tier 3 to defend against a god, it'd put the pressure on the attackers to go thralling. The amount of favor required should be increased as well for the same reasons, starting by increasing the cost of a coin to about 750 favor, and possibly even higher in the future if necessary. For most large clans, farming explosives takes very little time at all. So if farming gods becomes a tedious process, it'll make a lot more sense for clans to just default to regular raiding techniques like bombs and trebuchets, which is what most people enjoy the most anyways, both offensively and defensively. And despite being made more expensive, people like me who are determined to be a pain in the ass for larger clans will still take the time to farm up gods since they'll be necessary for the role that we play. They'll still be a factor, just not an ever-present one. And once they're harder to obtain, clans won't feel as pressured to maintain constant bubble up times, and larger clans will be a bit more hesitant to just throw gods around at anyone just because they feel like it. It'll be a more serious time investment to bring something that powerful to the field, which is ultimately how it should be. And in that same vein, I remember reading that thralls are supposed to shoot at gods and deal damage that way, 
But because gods deal so much damage to thralls, they typically die before their AI even kicks in. Reduce the damage thralls take from gods, so it becomes viable for people to use thralls as god defense instead of bubbles, which will also encourage people to build real bases instead of just stacking the crevice or the keyhole, since the more archers you have that can see an attacking god, the safer you'll be. Ultimately, gods as they are hold back servers just as much as they help. I want to see the mechanic remain in the game because, let's face it, gods are just fun and they make for great TV. They're an integral part of Conan's identity and they add so much flavor. We just need to make sure they're actually fun to deal with and do what they're supposed to do. And now we can move on to the combat suggestions, and this will actually be one of the shortest parts of the video since for the most part, combat is in a relatively good spot. Most of the problems with PvP don't actually stem from any combat mechanics. Grind, poisons, and ferocic weapons were already touched on, and if those are dealt with, a lot of other problems will disappear on their own, I think. However, daggers have become incredibly front-loaded with their damage, but I don't think cheese by itself is a problem. It's also how it feels to be cheesed in a game that's this grindy and inconsistent. That said, daggers do hit surprisingly hard. I don't really see why a weapon that stacks poisons twice as quickly, requires very little stamina to spam, and also includes a dash on every attack, should be dealing several hundred points of damage in a single light attack. In this clip, I'm wearing armor. Granted, not much armor, but it's armor all the same, with about 540 health. For something as oppressive as dagger spam can be, it really shouldn't be killing anybody in two hits. And keep in mind though that daggers do have some counterplay. If I had proper armor and better weaponry and better ping for that matter, I could have used hyper armor to trade into the daggers using something like a warhammer. Like I said earlier, making the game less grindy will naturally resolve a lot of these problems. If it didn't take so long to get to a point where I could trade damage, then it wouldn't really be a problem. But still, I think that the damage of the dagger light attacks needs to be reduced. Especially if each attack is stacking poisons twice as quickly, they already have plenty of extra damage that way. Once you've been hit a single time, it's extremely hard to get enough distance between you and the attacker to recover or respond. Given that the dagger attacks lunge you forward, it should take a bit more stamina. You can effectively stick to your target, no matter how many times they attempt to dodge roll away, and you'll always have more stamina in the end. There's very little room for punishment. Take into account auto lock as well, which with most weapons can give you some increased accuracy, but with daggers, every encounter is just lock on with Q and mash left click. So you don't even really have to aim, which takes all the skill out of the encounter. It's worth observing that daggers are only as strong as they are now after the removal of animation cancelling, something I'm not actually against conceptually. But it did reduce the overall mobility of players in combat. So if we're gonna make players less mobile, then weapons like claws and daggers that give free mobility have to be adjusted as well. It's just part of making a change like that work. I don't think cheese as a concept is bad or that daggers shouldn't ever be viable. Sometimes you're outnumbered, outgeared, or you're playing uphill in some other way and you just need to bust out the probe alone. We've all been there. Rust has yoka pistols and water pipes for the same reason. Reduce the grind surrounding PvP, reduce the damage on light attacks, and increase the stamina use so it's not so easy to spam, and daggers will still be able to fulfill their role as underhanded weapons without completely dominating every PvP encounter they're in. And speaking of completely dominating every PvP yeah, encounter yeah, they're in... Yeah. Delete horses. No, but for real, it's no secret that I hate horses and what they've done to the game. It's become something of a meme in my videos. For context, when horses were first added to the game, attacking from horseback did double damage, required no stamina, and applied a guaranteed status effect like bleed or cripple depending on what weapon you were using, while also slightly increasing the hitbox of your attack. And it stayed that way for literally years. For those of you that never experienced that, consider yourself lucky. They've been nerfed since then, which I'm very thankful for, but the trouble is that so long as there is no specific counterplay, aka mechanics designed to answer mounted combat, Horses will always be bad for the game on a mechanical level. Attacks cost stamina now, but because your movement drains horse stamina rather than your own, regen starts basically instantly, making running out of stamina on horseback functionally impossible. You no longer deal bonus damage, but you can still kill a fully armored high vitality player in a single hit with a lance, and there are more than a few examples of people testing this. There are still no real mechanics in the game that are specifically designed to counter horses. They have so much health and armor that killing them can be a struggle by itself, and the mobility granted by horses makes it extremely difficult to punish somebody even if they play terribly. It's always possible for them to just gallop away. It's not uncommon for somebody on a horseback to easily fight outnumbered against much greater opponents. And for the most part, PvPers tend to be in agreement on this as well, and generally speaking, the vast majority of people who play Devil's Advocate aren't really PvPers at all. 
I'm not one of those people who thinks that you should have thousands of hours in a game before you have an opinion. There's nothing that says someone who started yesterday can't share an opinion that's insightful and valuable. But horseback combat is one of those things where having some experience is really important in fully understanding the issue. It's easy enough to claim that players should just adapt to horseback combat, find some way to beat it on foot, or bring their own horse. But when I hear people say these things, I know they don't have the experience to understand why it's such a bad response. Never mind how you're supposed to overcome being killed in a single shot, but bring up any PvP issue on the forums and suddenly everybody turns into Sun Tzu and they try to drop some real wisdom on you. If they're on a horse, you climb, of course. Wow! Let me get some paper so I can take some notes, oh wise master, but uh, hey Uguay, let me lay this one on you. If the literal only response to a game mechanic is to climb a rock and run for your fucking life while hoping to god they lose interest, maybe it's not a great mechanic. Just saying. But I want to take a look at the horse problem from another angle, because I think too many people get caught up in discussing whether or not it's possible to kill somebody on a horse, as if that's the problem, and neglect all of the other side effects of horses as a mechanic. Though I will say now, in plain English, that having a horse gives you an unreasonable advantage in combat, and anybody denying that is delusional. But let's really flesh out the issue here. We'll start with the one-shot problem because it's the easiest to tie into everything else. You can't ask people to spend days at a time farming the absolute best in slot gear only to die in half a millisecond. There's no timeline where that results in good player retention. We talked about this same problem with daggers. With the amount of prep time and investment required just to participate in PvP, you can't have people dying in such unsatisfying ways. Two left clicks from a dagger or a single collision with a lance and it's all over. It sucks. Lances also become readied very quickly, even at low speeds, and have a tendency to hit multiple times if moving at the right speed. Even if you bring your own horse, it's a game of who gets hit first with very little skill involved otherwise. And group horse PvP is just a numbers game. And as long as we mention the dude just bring your own horse argument, let's talk about why that's a dog shit take. The first issue is obviously that not everybody likes mounted combat. This game has really well designed ground combat systems with all kinds of weapons and playstyles and strategies. But because horses outclass everything else, you're forced into using it just to stay viable. Which means people can't play in the ways that they prefer. So yeah, you can, quote, just bring your own horse, if you want to have a chance at one-shotting them before they one-shot you. But if that's not something you enjoy, you're trading victory for not having any fun. It's not good game design for a single playstyle to so drastically overpower everything else, especially when that playstyle equates to equipping a lance and holding W with no greater thought beyond that. Not to mention that even just getting a horse further increases the barrier to entry, since you have to obtain them from specific locations and they take 6 hours to grow. It's just another thing that gets in the way of PvP readiness and slows down the rate of encounters in a game where getting PvP at all can be a real challenge. But I tell you what, let's look at the big picture here, because horses affect the game in ways that horse apologists, a curse be upon them, don't even consider. For example, the impact on macro play. Choosing your base location is one of the most important decisions you make on a PvP server, and there's a lot to consider. Convenience being one of the most important in two different ways. A base that is located in a convenient location will often be in much greater danger, and building your base in a wayward place can buy you some breathing room at the expense of convenience. You can choose to build your base far away from highly trafficked areas and far away from any obelisks, to delay being scouted by sometimes weeks if your enemies are lazy. But horses, in conjunction with the economy update, which we will be revisiting later, complicate things. Fast travel already made the map fairly small, but with a map room and a horse, you can be anywhere on the map in no time at all. It's still basically mandatory to live off the beaten path if you don't want to get raided day one, but the inconvenience counts for less, since the time it takes to ride around the map and look for bases, or to reach your base after finding it, is that much easier. This is partly why so many solos and small groups have switched to using chests with boosted decay timers and a nomadic lifestyle to survive. Horses, among many other factors, make regular survival impractical. Adding insult to injury, horses don't bring any benefit at all to that nomadic playstyle because you can't effectively use horses while over encumbered. So we're all stuck jogging around with our base in our pockets while the big clans just run everybody down. But this causes another problem though, since not being able to use horses while encumbered has a real impact on farmers. So being ganked is part of the game, but being set up to be ganked shouldn't be. Nobody wants to be set up for ganks or forced into situations where they can't help but be ganked. Conan more so than really any other game out there has an incredibly long, punishing early game, so making people vulnerable in this early state when they are already at a disadvantage guarantees player burnout. Even once players reach a state of viability, if you continuously set them up for failure, it doesn't really matter because the turnover is going to be the same. So what does this have to do with horses? Well, like I said, you can't ride horses while over encumbered. 
or at least you can't ride them well. For those of you that watched my farming video, you know that I know what I'm talking about when it comes to farming efficiently, and if you haven't seen it, I'm just going to ask you to trust me. I have a lot of experience farming under duress as a solo on official PvP servers, and if you want to get the most out of your farming trips, you have to be in a farming spec, and you're going to be over encumbered, which means you can't use a horse to travel more quickly. But do you know who can use horses while you're farming? The guy who's going to gank you. And see, once upon a time, there was this magical period of time where there were no horses. If you saw somebody on the horizon, you had options as a farmer. You could try to break line of sight and either make a run for it or hide, since Conan's vision system was realistic. If it was just one person and you were confident, you could even try fighting them, since at the very least they'd be on foot. It's unlikely that you would win in a farming spec, but you had a chance at least. But now horses exist. So the ganker can move fast enough that running away or losing them in some trees is basically impossible. Conan now also has this neat, if you want to call it that, little feature where you can display health bars at an absurd range. So even if you run away and hide under a rock, they can see your health bar through walls. And so basically, now every gank is from somebody with infinite stamina, better speed, and a built-in ESP system. So the minute you see somebody on a horse, you might as well just rip off your bracelet. Now, consider this. Which clans do you think are doing the ganking? If you're playing solo or in a small team, you're going to have your hands full getting set up. As we've stressed countless times, there's a lot to farm. Finding time in your day to camp at Obelisk or go looking for farmers isn't realistic for small groups. You're only setting yourself behind. The clans that do have the manpower to field gank squads are, as always, the larger clans. Or at least the clans that have already established themselves on the server. So once again, we have another mechanic that artificially buffs large group play in a game where the servers only hold 40 people. Now, of course, there are ways to play around this, and people try to make these arguments all the time. Zero, you should be vulnerable if you farm alone. You should be farming in teams. Again, larger clans can afford to field bodyguards for their farmers, but smaller clans can't. When Jumpy and I play, our hands are full. If we only farmed as a pair instead of splitting our workload, we'd be cutting our farming potential in half right then and there. But even outside that, there's things you can do. You can farm less trafficked areas, for example. Go out of your way to farm resources in less efficient areas. You can stay in a combat setup and use bearer thralls to carry your loot as well, but there's some drawbacks there. Like I said earlier, I know a thing or two about farming. Using thralls to carry your loot can work when you're farming a single resource since stack sizes were buffed a while ago, and I imagine it was partially done specifically for this. But if you're trying to be efficient in multi-farm, things fall apart right then and there. Berries obviously won't stack with pork or stone or glass flasks, and a standard farming trip will fill your inventory with tons of supplies. So if you agree to use a bearer thrall to do your farming, you're cutting your efficiency even further and limiting yourself to farming only a single resource semi-efficiently, or a number of resources really poorly. For certain resources, you could be reducing your efficiency by up to 80%. And remember, thralls have a limited inventory, even if you're only filling it with a single resource which puts a hard cap on how much you can farm at all without depoting, which means you're going to have to factor in the travel time of going back and forth to farming bases. And when it comes to farming less efficient areas, just think. A single clear of the brimstone lake, for example, will give you thousands and thousands and thousands of brimstone. How long do you think it'll take to get that from one of the caves? Even if it doesn't take that long, if it takes you more than a few trips, you're waiting on respawn times, additional travel time every time you go there, and so on. Every time you commit to a less efficient farm for the sake of safety, you really need to do the math. It's costing you a lot more time than you think. So let's put it all into context, because there's this idea that if you can play around horses, that makes them balanced. But if you really sit down and look at it, I don't really think they are. Every type of combat that isn't horse-related is rendered completely unviable. Anyone in less than heavy armor is liable to die in a single hit from someone on horseback. And even if you bring your own horse in heavy armor, whoever gets hit first loses, and you can still die in a single hit. The barrier to entry is arbitrarily higher, since PvP encounters can be entirely decided by who has more horses. Not just there, but in storage as well, so farming them becomes mandatory. The larger footprint for bases required by the economy update mixed with the increased travel speed of horses means it's harder for smaller clans to hide and the viability of building in the middle of nowhere gets a direct nerf. Solos and smaller clans exist to be gank meat for bored larger clans, even more than they were before while farming, and the only response is to either accept the wildly increased risk of farming and die without recourse, or intentionally hamstring your own farming potential to spend exponentially more time farming fewer resources in a game where the grind wall is already way too punishing in the best of circumstances. And all of this while knowing that there is not one single mechanic in the game that directly counters horses. You can't brace your spear to stop a horse charge, there's no special attack to dismount an enemy. Your only option is to drain that horse's stamina to knock them off, which they can immediately remount the minute their stamina is back. Even if you want to spec into archery and bring a bow and arrow, you're still being forced into a specific playstyle to counter the universality of horses. 
increasing the amount of resources you have to put into any given kit by spending on arrows, and increasing the resources you risk losing should you die. All of this just because horses exist. All of that is one fat opportunity cost, so we can have the entire game revolve around these four-legged tumors. The addition of horses has been a disaster for the PvP experience, and the only people that tend to disagree with that statement are foreign PvPers that have never played on an official in their lives. You can go on thread after thread saying people just need to adapt and overcome, but for most people, adapting to Conan's obtuse game design means uninstalling and playing something else. So the sooner we admit there's a fucking problem, the sooner we can move past it. And for those of you that shriek at the top of your lungs about how horses should be powerful because being on a horse was powerful in real life, war horses also frequently had to be put down after developing PTSD, lances typically broke after the first charge, killing a horse in combat wasn't hard at all, charging into pikes was suicide, and in the age of prehistoric man, horses hadn't been bred to be large enough to hold a fully armored person, so mounted combat consisted of chariots drawn by multiple horses, and even then, during the Bronze Age collapse, armies of lightly armored chads with pointy sticks were able to outmaneuver them so greatly that they were able to take down almost every major military power around the Mediterranean with such ferocity that civilization and riding as we knew it ceased to exist for hundreds of years, so... Yeah, horses gave you an advantage, but even real life had better counterplay for horses than Conan does. It goes without saying that if we had the resources, an overhaul of the mountain system would be in order. We're trying to keep things as easy as possible to implement because we're being realistic here, so let's see what we can do point by point. Firstly, the lance. It goes without saying that being one shot in a game like Conan is a problem. Technically, yes, you can block lances with shields, but that doesn't remove the threat, it just buys you some time. And if they bump you with the horse first before the lance hits, you're still going to get lance because it's going to knock you over first. And because horses make very little noise and render in very late due to server lag, you also don't tend to even see somebody coming till it's already too late. There needs to be more counterplay. Attacks from horseback should drain stamina from the horse to a lesser degree. Currently, stamina regen is paused when you perform any stamina draining action, but quickly starts to regenerate afterwards. Because sprinting on horseback uses the horse's stamina, not your own, you never really run out of stamina, so trading attacks with somebody that isn't on a horse can go on indefinitely. Readying the lance should drain your stamina as well, similar to how drawing a bow currently does. As it is, lances require zero stamina to use, so even if the attack is blocked or dodged, it costs you nothing to make that mistake. Keep in mind that if you succeed in your lance attack even a single time, you could kill your opponent. So there's no reason for this to be a risk-free move. Adding a drain to this would mean that if you can bait out the lance charge, you'd have a reasonable chance of punishing and dismounting them. Made even more practical if attacks from horseback are made to drain horse stamina. The damage ceiling on lances needs to be reduced as well, to players specifically if possible. I don't think there's any room for one-shot mechanics in a game like Conan, especially not against fully armored and high vitality targets. I mean, I feel like we've talked enough about the barrier to entry as it is. We can't balance the game around the assumption that everyone has 60 vitality and 2000 armor without immediately outclassing everybody that hasn't sunk 120 hours of grind into whatever server they're on. Horses should also take additional stamina damage for players. Making all these changes at once could be overkill, but honestly I think horses being weak is preferable to being overpowered, so not the worst outcome. If player damage to horse stamina is increased, and attacking from a horseback also drains horse stamina, mounted opponents don't get to just ride around forever with a largely unpunishable moveset. Positioning poorly will set you up for a dismount, relying on lances all day will drain your horse, and spamming attacks is likely to get you killed. And basically, it'll mean that you'll have to play smart on horseback just like on foot, which is how it should be. And it's worth noting that we didn't talk about rhinos at all, and that's because even though rhinos have an equally high chance of being an absolute tumor in combat, unlike horses, they have actual downsides. They use more stamina when moving, they're less maneuverable, anybody riding a rhinoceros is held higher, so hitting ground targets is harder, and more importantly, you can't use lances while riding a rhino, so there's no one-shot mechanics. I'm not really going anywhere with that, it's just interesting that we have two different kinds of mounts available, and one is actually pretty close to being perfectly balanced already. So obviously, if changes roll out to mounted combat, maybe take a look at the state of rhinos, since they'd be at risk of being underpowered. Though, like I said, I'd rather mounts be underpowered than overpowered. In fact, I'd be okay with mounted combat not existing at all, if I'm being honest. We talked about how horses disproportionately set up smaller clans and solos to be ganked while farming. Unfortunately, a lot of this is just the way that Conan is. Like I said, people on horseback sometimes won't even render in until they're already impaling you, but we do have some options for dealing with it. First, and most obviously, the whole seeing health bars through walls thing. I've even been accused of cheating in my videos because people aren't aware that's an actual game feature. That's how alienating it is. People see that and they just assume it's an ESP hack. I won't dwell on it since there's a forum post stating it was a bad idea and the devs are going to rework it, but that was three months ago. 
I'm just saying, the sooner this gets handled, the better, and if there's really no way to make this work properly, just disable it for PvP servers. It's already a server setting, and Conan has enough problems as it is. There's no shame in pulling the plug and just focusing your efforts elsewhere. I can't tell you how many stealthy raids I couldn't have done if health bars were visible. And the fact that somebody can stare at my base and see me inside is ludicrous. No more sneaking out the back during a raid or surprising enemies with a charge. It's a ridiculous feature. As for the ganking concept, I have a roundabout way of alleviating the issue. A while back, the stack sizes for most items was increased. I don't remember why, I'm pretty sure it was to reduce server lag. But it had the byproduct of making farming with bearer thralls a lot more viable, which was huge. Ideally, at least on PvP servers, I don't think the default farming run should be someone in a farming spec. I want to see the default stack sizes for raw materials increased even further, along with the inventory size of bearer thralls. I'm talking about things like wood, stone, iron, brimstone, and even glass flasks, just the things that you'd be farming in bulk anyways. This way it's considerably more viable for players to farm in a combat setup and use bearer thralls to transport their loot, which is important since sometimes it feels like when I play Conan 99% of the time is just spent farming and grinding. So if I do bump into someone and I can't fight, it's not going to be fun for me. If players can defend themselves while farming reliably, that takes a huge portion of playtime that is otherwise uneventful and turns it into potentially interesting PvP. And when you think about it, the problem at its core isn't really that people are being ganked, because ganking and being ganked is just part of the game. The problem is that farmers are sitting ducks that are set up to be ganked without recourse by the game's design. If that gets fixed, people can take the risk of farming in high traffic areas if they're confident in their combat skills. More players will feel comfortable farming in the open instead of at 3am on a Tuesday. And coupled with clan size changes, we'll see a lot more players bumping into each other more often in ways that actually lead to good gameplay. Players will still need to be in an encumbered spec to properly loot bases, and really big farm trips or resource transporting will still require an encumbered setup, so it doesn't render anything redundant, it just alleviates this specific issue. You could just, uh, delete horses. Moving on, we need to talk about the server transfers. Firstly, the ability to transfer with an inventory of items at any time means players can just fill up their pockets and upload mid-raid. With the right sigils and setup, even a large, well-supplied base can be fully uploaded in just a few inventories. Jumping Down actually just did it in one of the more recent episodes, and don't worry, we're gonna come back to that. Pin that in your mind for a sec. The problem is twofold. Obviously, for the attackers who spent all that time and effort fighting, farming, and grinding to get to this raid, the entire base disappears without any counterplay. And as with most of the latest and greatest features in Conan, clans with more bodies to transfer can take more stuff. So larger clans have an even easier time of emptying their base if they think they're about to get wiped compared to solos and duos who have to leave things behind. We'll talk about raiding more once we finally make our way to the building section of this video, but defending a raid can actually be really easy and frustrating for the attackers. You can place building pieces through walls in Kona without line of sight and repair building pieces indefinitely. And if you manage to finally overpower their defenses, work through their thralls, blast through their many repaired walls, you'll still just find the base empty, only to have them transfer back later that week. This also removes the incentive for fighting out a difficult fight. We saw this on my EU playthrough, where nearly every single clan on the server decided it wasn't worth it and one by one either quit or uploaded away. And sure, to be fair, with the current 10-man clan limit and unraidable bases, being stuck on a server like that can be a nightmare. But the point is that nobody has any incentive to fight a battle where they might not win. So many of the incredible experiences I've had in this game were uphill battles. With server transfers on the table, I don't think those kind of playthroughs can ever happen again. Why go through all that trouble and fight that hard when you can just move somewhere easier? And so, as you might imagine, if everybody can just run from every fight, there won't be any fighting, which is pretty close to what happens on a lot of servers. In a game where making PvP happen is already pretty difficult, server transfers only make things worse. They also introduce the concept of a farming server. Players can farm at peak efficiency on an empty server with no competition, and then casually transfer that loot onto a living server. Farm servers mean wiping or punishing a group of players becomes impossible, and balancing raids around resource requirements is similarly impossible. Let's say I managed to somehow wipe some toxic clan somewhere, but they're being funded by some farming server. Did I really accomplish anything? Even if I wipe their base, they just transfer in the next round of supplies and it's like nothing even happened. Take God Favor for example. The fastest way to farm Favor is to either chain together surges or farm the Black Galleon. Both of those options require you to either mark your location on the map or farm in a central area of the map, increasing the odds that someone might 1. interfere, but also 2. learn that you're farming gods and respond accordingly. We talked about making gods harder to get by increasing what it takes to summon one, but a change like that makes zero difference if people can just free farm and transfer it in. 
And once again, it's a feature that enables larger groups because when you transfer out all of your stuff decays, unless you have someone left in the claim. So if you don't have any alternate accounts or someone that can hold your base for you, you can't even benefit from farming servers at all. And even if you do manage to use a farming server to counter somebody else's farming server, that's bad too. The only reason to play a full loot PvP game like Conan is for the emergent gameplay. If I'm alone on one server and you're alone farming on another server, there's no interaction taking place. There's no rivalry forming as we're fighting each other on a server. There's no war brewing as heated words go into the global chat. It almost completely removes all of the player interaction up to the point of the transfer. And even once the transfer is done, Say a large clan transfers to your server one day and just wipes it in an evening because nobody saw it coming and had no reason to prepare for it. Is that satisfying? Is that good? Is that what anybody wants? Again, no buildup, no story, no emergent gameplay, no human interaction. You just get wiped and that's it. You don't even know what server they transfer to when they're gone. There's no timeline where this results in good player retention. In fact, let me rephrase it in a way that really emphasizes the point because I don't think the developers are really respecting how big of a problem this is. I said in the beginning that something Conan does uniquely well is making small scale wars feel like big conflicts, which is to say Conan as a system encourages really good emergent gameplay. Server transfers undermine the literal one thing Conan does better than every other game on the market. How do we do this? How do we live like this, guys? People are farming alone on dead servers. Raids don't matter. People just quit if there's danger and large clans move from server to server, wiping people with infinite materials they couldn't see coming. And people are interacting less than they already were. It's a problem. And that's not even to mention the elephant in the room. This game has had so many dupes, so many hacker groups, so much cheated loot, and it's all sitting on body vaults on dead servers where at least it would stay. If there's a toxic clan that's using exploits or hacks or whatever, they're stuck on a single server unless they want to farm up and start over on another one. So there's at least that slight barrier, but transfers just set it all loose, and that's exactly what we saw with the usual suspects rolling from server to server causing problems the minute transfers went live. I'd be more forgiving if it wasn't for the fact that we had so many threads on the forums explaining all of this for months and months before it was implemented. We knew that if server transfers went live, it would kill off several of the few living servers we had left and would result in a less healthy game overall. And they still went through with it. In fact, not only did they go through with it, but when we took to the forums to explain why it's a bad idea with proof this time, showing exactly what we said would happen did happen, their response was to lower the cooldown from seven days to three to make it even easier. I really do think that there's a degree of contempt sometimes when the changes roll out. I try not to be such a pessimist these days, especially in this video. But come on, man. Tell me tell me they don't do that on purpose sometimes. People beg for something to change and they just make it worse on purpose? Like, come on. And to play devil's advocate, if Conan was in a better spot, transfers wouldn't be the worst thing ever. All those 10-man clans that are otherwise unchallenged on a given server would have a lot more competition from invaders, and players looking for a challenge could hop servers and skip the early game, and a server dying wouldn't mean that you had to lose all your stuff. The problem is that Conan isn't in a great spot balance-wise, so instead of increasing competition, server transfers just export dysfunction. I know that at least a couple decent server wars have happened since the transfers were added, but for every time the transfers work as intended, there were seven other servers that got hollowed out from the same feature. And I'd just like to remind everybody as well that invasions were always a thing, they were just a bit slower without item transfers. And before we start suggesting fixes for this though, it'd be irresponsible to ignore the other elephant in the room. Conan has had very, very, very mild instances of what could be described as pay to win in the past. And we don't really have time to discuss all that since this video is long enough, but being able to transfer items from Sipta to the Exiled Lands is absolutely pay to win. If you don't start on a Sipta server, you're gimping yourself since everyone else is doing it because there's nothing in the Exiled Lands that can match anything in Sipta. It's a flat advantage. But again, we told Funcom this and they did it anyways. But let's try to stay positive. What do we do about this? I'll say first that I don't think the transfers are actually so far off the mark. Conan's early game is its weakest point as far as PvP is concerned. You can't deal damage, you can't progress through PvP like in Rust, and you can't effectively farm so you can get to level 60 and have better tools and thralls. Leveling a new character takes an age and a half since almost every good experience source besides killing monsters has been harshly nerfed over the years. Basically, if you want to hit 60 in a day, you're either crafting and dismantling fish trophies, which is mind-numbingly boring, or you're killing gorillas for 8 hours, which isn't that much better. Really, the early game does nothing for the gameplay and just serves to push players away, since the game doesn't really start until you're level 60 if you're looking to PvP. And even once you hit 60, that's where the grinding starts. You haven't even begun to grind yet. So the way I see it, Funcom has, in typical fashion, implemented a really complicated solution with many unintended consequences to a very simple problem. 
On PvP servers, remove the transfer feature altogether and just give players the option to spawn in as level 60. Let's face it, there is no early game for Conan PvP because it's not a PvP game. And server transfers were only really put on the table because role players wanted to be able to take their Exiled Lands character to Sipta without making a new character and breaking immersion. All of the PvP restrictions were added after the fact to try to limit the shit show, and it kinda didn't work. So just drop the pretense and just let people skip the leveling process. Without transfers, the servers don't have to deal with complicated uploads and imports and keeping track of player data and inventories and moving loot between servers and so on, but players can still more easily move from one server to another and skip small portion of the early game grind. At least, most players. Put a pin in that, we're gonna come back to it in a sec. As it is, people are basically already spawning in as level 60s. They're just bringing a whole lot of extra headings with them. Just simplify it, acknowledge that Conan isn't a PvP game and just throw us a bone here. As for transferring items as a concept, I don't see any way for server transfers with items to ever work. This game lives and dies by its player interaction, and if you discourage or diminish that, the game falls apart. And we've got enough gameplay loops to balance without having to deal with players injecting bodies full of 20,000 dragon powder at a time. And hey, as long as we're talking about bodies, let's talk about body vaults. What's the deal with body vaults anyhow? For those of you that don't know what I mean, if you can log out on a server, your body remains where it is indefinitely. Obviously, this could block building locations, so if you're on a PvE server where you can't kill players, this could cause some problems. So Funcom has it so that bodies that remain logged out long enough just disappear from the game world. But if you log back in, your body reappears with all of its loot. Essentially, it means that players can store a full body's worth of loot when they quit a server and they can keep it indefinitely since nobody can touch it once the body disappears. This opens up many, many problems. As I mentioned earlier, it's the primary method of storing duped loot, cheated gear, and legacy gear, and so on. Having a large clan transfer into your server, wipe you, and then leave is pretty shitty, but body vaults can do a similar thing where a clan that you didn't know was on a server can just log in one day, pull out their vaults filled with thousands of dragon powder, wipe you, and then leave again, without giving you any real player interaction. It goes without saying, but bodies don't actually need to disappear on PvP servers anyway, since you can just kill players if they're in the way. There's no reason for this to be an active feature that everybody has to play around. I could see it being a lag-reducing measure, since if you have a billion hidden bodies all over the map with tons of loot inside, it'd probably get pretty laggy, so here's an alternative. Instead of disappearing, players should just die. Boom. Problem solved. Nobody keeps loot forever. If you want to keep loot on a server, you gotta play on that server. If you want to wipe a server, fine, but you have to log in, farm those bombs, and actually use them. Not just pull out a body vault of dupe shit from 2019. If you're not playing on a server, just have some grace and move on. Let's go back to the issue being wiped by server transfers and body vaults, because that gives us a platform to really tie all this together. It goes without saying that there's a variety of different ways in which any given situation can play out. Even if the outcome is settled, the way in which the situation plays out is important. The problem isn't that people are being wiped, or that people are being ganked, or that the game contains grind even if you want to tie everything together. It's that all of these things are producing their outcomes in the worst way possible. In a weird sort of way, Conan's actually doing everything it needs to do, it's just kind of doing it really poorly. Take the ganking scenario for example. Let's say you can more easily farm in a combat setup and somebody ganks you. Let's just imagine that the ganker isn't on horseback. I know it's unrealistic, but just roll with it. And you fight tooth and nail, exchanging blows, and maybe you even get really close to killing him. Compare it to how it usually plays out, and you're in an artificially gimped farming setup and some guy just kills you in one shot off horseback. Even though you still died in both scenarios, there's a world of difference in how it feels for the player. In the first example, you feel capable, maybe even empowered. You think to yourself, man, I could have had that. And you start gearing up, thinking about what you could have changed. Subconsciously, you almost want to get attacked again to see how you would fare the second time around. There's important psychology at play here. Making victory achievable is an important part of making any interaction desirable. It's what makes so many gameplay loops so addicting. It's that, let me try one more time, I'm sure I could win, just one more fight. That's what we want people to be saying. Those little victories where you fight and maybe even win in situations you didn't see coming are a crucial part of the experience in any PvP game. And using horses and obtuse farming mechanics turns it into an experience that can only be enjoyed by larger groups that can afford bodyguards and so on. Denying something so fundamental to the rest of the players is the gameplay equivalent of a cake recipe with no flour, or eggs, or sugar. It's, it's just really weird. With server transfers and body vaults, we get that same problem. Building a base and defending it is almost as fun as attacking one. A lot of my fondest memories are defending and failing to defend bases I've built. So when transfers allow clans to just appear suddenly with enough resources and manpower to completely overpower an established clan, it's a worse outcome for everybody. 
the clan that gets wiped misses out on the opportunity to really develop enemies, build up rivalries, and enjoy some of the strength they have. If invaders start from scratch, they can interfere with their growth, move and react to the threat, and even if it is still ultimately ending in a wipe, they'll get a few weeks of solid, enjoyable gameplay out of it. Again, like the ganking scenario, if you felt like you could have won, your perception of the entire situation changes. But the invaders didn't start from scratch, and they got overwhelmed overnight, outnumbered 10 to 4 on the day of the raid, and outgunned by thousands of explosives. Then the invaders leave, and with the invaders and the previously largest clan gone, the server dies out because nobody's interested in joining a barebones server with a declining player base. So not only was that clan cheated out of a decent war, the entire server was robbed out of its conflict. So when you really put everything together, you can start to understand the problem, why this game has never had more content than it has right now, and yet the servers are still empty. Almost every single mechanic sabotages the intended experience. From the overly tedious farming, the total lack of an early or mid game for PvP, the absurd barrier to entry for PvP, the overpowered horses, the absolute state of server transfers, and so on, it's amazing anybody gets a good time out of this game at all. I mean, I appreciated it when Funcom decided to plug my latest solo series on Twitter, even if they did misspell my name. Which, yeah, granted, it's tough to spell, you know, I'll give you some slack. But I was also cringing a little bit because I knew that that series was not going to make the game look good. If anything, it's a perfect example of what's wrong with the game and the perfect support for everything I've said so far. So we'll just quickly summarize everything so far and wrap up this first section of the video because believe it or not, we still have a lot to talk about. All of the changes I've suggested so far are designed to alleviate unnecessary tedium, get more players to experience the best parts of the game without making it too easy, and replace mechanics that favor large group play in favor of systems that empower smaller groups. This is because I believe that if the servers can only hold 40 people, tailoring the game for large group play is self-sabotaging. Choosing instead to favor smaller to medium-sized groups should hopefully have the effect of making the game more consistently rewarding, easier to get into, and promote healthier server atmospheres. Additionally, removing certain systems like body vaults and server transfers, and horses, will encourage higher quality player interaction and emergent gameplay, which I believe to be Conan's greatest strength. Which brings us to the final point of this section. The official PvP servers have to be wiped at least once. There's no way around it. None of these changes are going to stick otherwise. In fact, I'd go so far as to say you shouldn't implement any change I suggest without wiping the servers. It'd either be pointless or introduce new problems. Why make gods expensive if people have gods saved up in the thousands? How do you even adjust clan sizes for clans that are already full, and so on and so forth? And let's face it, the servers aren't exactly popping. How many people are really going to be inconvenienced by this? I'm sure the 80 hour a week poop sockers will be real heartbroken about their ultra stacked unraidable base disappearing, but the other 99% of the player base only stands to gain from a wipe. Give the servers a fresh start to experience the new 3.0 drop and give everybody a chance at playing the game the way it's meant to be played without having to wrestle with 5 years of baggage and dupes and entrenched alphas and so on. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. Alright, so we finally made it past the millions of little tweaks I had written down. It goes without saying that I could fill a full 12 hour video with every little thing I'd change, but we covered the big stuff and that's what counts. We've just got two little things to cover before we can move on. One meta issue and a potential problem down the line. Firstly, the meta issue, or more accurately the meta category. Uh, content creation. I think this is largely already understood in the industry, but content creators are free advertising. I've never seen an advertisement for Rust in my life, but I have seen tons and tons of gameplay videos from people like Wellen and Spoonkid. The whole reason I even started making narrated gameplay videos was because I was inspired by people like Wellen. And since then, my tiny little channel has racked up a few million views for Conan Exiles, and I get a lot of comments from people who say the only reason they even bought Conan was because of my videos. So let's cut to the chase. The streamer mode needs work, and we gotta make some changes for PvP content creators. Streamer mode, for those of you not aware, is a setting in most games that either masks private information or changes it in some way so that if you're showing your display, or in my case recording gameplay, you don't have to worry about the footage leaking your account details like your name, or Funcom ID, hint hint. In games like Rust and Sea of Thieves, having streamer mode on does exactly that, but it also changes player names and whatnot to make content creation easier so you don't have to worry about censoring any details. Conan is a little bit different. Every account has a largely unchangeable Funcom ID tied to it. The only way to change it is to send it a ticket with a good reason and wait, which the last time I had this done took two months, which is a problem. I want every playthrough I have to be cleaned and free of tampering by bad actors. I don't want people harassing me and following me from server to server just because I'm a YouTuber, and I don't want people going easy on me either. I want clean, unadulterated gameplay, so staying anonymous is super important. 
Thankfully, I've not actually been followed from server to server before, but that's because I inconvenience myself greatly by making fresh characters every time and buying new accounts. I've never been banned before, but I still have multiple accounts to my name, and I really shouldn't have to do that. Normally, you'd think I could probably get a few playthroughs out of a single Funcom ID, right? Except the streamer mode doesn't really help me there either. It will hide the server number and Funcom IDs of players on the player list, but if I type in the global chat, it displays my unchanged name, and if I edit a sign, it'll display last edited by, followed by my Funcom ID for the world to see, and attached to my name. And worse still, if I play with friends, even with streamer mode on, anytime I get near them, it will display their nameplate along with their Funcom ID. This needs work. Yes, I can disable nameplates, but I need to know who I'm fighting in the wild and sometimes it will still display nameplates. Plus, bodies will still display their normal names, and that doesn't solve the chat problem. If streamer mode is on, Funcom IDs should never be displayed. Not mine, not allies, not enemies, not on signs, nowhere, no how. Either that, or add an option to display Funcom IDs separately from name tags, so I can still see who I'm fighting without having their Funcom ID posted. The same for allies. Names for players should be scrambled and replaced with generic names. If you need a list of names, just give them thrall names like Delincia Snowhunter, or something so people like myself can still interact with the chat without outing ourselves and everyone else on the server in the recorded footage. The Funcom ID thing by itself is a headache, because players can access this even if you don't talk or show your face. There's still websites that index player data and display a list of Funcom ID is connected to any server for everybody to see, which kind of makes the hidden player list a bit of a meme, doesn't it? I can see how Funcom IDs might make the servers easier to police despite the downsides, but we need to set up some kind of creator program where people like myself can have our tickets expedited. I don't always have time to play Conan. I can't always wait two months for my ID to change just to avoid getting followed and harassed. Just make my job a little easier. Help me help you. And also, make the player list public again. People can bypass the hidden list as it is, so it's not giving anybody any privacy. It's not preventing offline raids, it's just encouraging people to never talk in the global chat. A multiplayer game where people are punished for talking to each other. With everything set to private, even full servers feel empty when nobody's talking. But we have another problem. Even if the Funcom ID thing and streamer modes are dealt with, I still have to change my name if I want to be left alone, which is a unique burden for content creators. After the addition of server transfers, theoretically, anybody who hits level 60 should never have to level another character again, right? But people like me still have to. Remember I said to put a pin in that moment where Jumby and I transferred out mid-raid? Because as we discussed in the server transfer section, that's something that shouldn't be happening. Of course, at the same time, we're a couple of level 30s living in a closet just trying to get off the server anyways. Like, sorry I didn't surrender my loot to the first guys that showed up. But even there, why are Jumpy and I getting raided at level 30 in a closet after starting from scratch when the game has server transfers? He and I have more hours than most people. Surely we should have some level 60 characters and fully built bases somewhere. Oh, right. It's because we're trying to make content, so we have to start over where other people don't to mask our identities. There's no reason why we should have even been in that vulnerable state. It's like we're being punished for just trying to make content for the game, and personally I'm really tired of dismantling fish traps and killing gorillas and buying new accounts every time I want to play. This is also why I suggested earlier about just letting people spawn in as level 60 so people like us can just make new characters and get rolling without the added tax of having to level every time. Alternatively, just allow people to change their names when they transfer servers. Yeah, this could open up another can of worms since people can hop servers and change their names, but the real data is server side and it doesn't make it any harder to police the servers, especially since they're not changing their Funcom IDs and people that really want to change their names are going to anyways. So I don't know how realistic it is, but if we can improve the stream mode and make sure content creators can more easily change their Funcom IDs and possibly also their in-game names, it'll make it a lot easier for us to advertise the game and bring in new players. And setting the player list back to public will make servers a lot more fun to play on, and frankly that just helps with content generation anyways. So I have one other thing that I'd like to talk about before we move on, and it's a bit different from everything else we've talked about because it's actually not in the game, and I'd like it to stay that way. Dynamic building damage is an awful, awful idea. Please don't ever enable it. The fact that dynamic building damage is almost universally considered to be a good idea on the forums perfectly illustrates why that cesspit is a terrible place for PvP feedback. Dynamic building damage. Essentially, it's a system that is supposed to prevent offline raiding. If enabled, players would be raidable whenever they're online in up to 30 minutes after they log out, but after that, they're unraidable. Additionally, it was said that if dynamic building damage was enabled, 
It would be on 24-7 with no additional raid windows during the week, but the weekend would still have regular raid windows that wouldn't require you to be online to be raided, just like the raid windows we have now. On the surface, it seems like the best of both worlds. You can't be offline during the week, there's still a raid window on the weekend, and everybody lives happily ever after. Or so it would seem. Dynamic building damage will render this game unplayable, and I cannot believe that more people don't understand this. Let's just start with the raid mechanics first. God tokens and trebuchets both take a full hour to construct, and you have to add that time to however long it takes you and your team to organize, get kitted up, travel to the enemy base, and build a raid base. So just based off the crafting time alone, if the grace period for dynamic building damage is 30 minutes, you can log out and completely dodge most raids. It's an easy fix though, right? Just make the grace period long enough to account for trebs and gods so people can't abuse it. But then, if the grace period is long enough to allow for you to be raided after logging out, it's not preventing you from being offline anymore, since people can just wait for the minute you log out to strike. Basically, either the window is short enough that the system will be abused, or it's long enough that the system doesn't work. You can't give people control of the raid window without unintended consequences. But let's say we do it this way instead. If a building takes damage, the raid window gets extended. So that way if somebody starts a raid on your base, you can't just log out without consequence. Okay, so hypothetically, anytime you're online, someone could walk up to your base, poke it with a spear, and now you're not allowed to log out. If I was a total shithead, I could just sit there and deal the smallest amount of damage necessary to keep extending that raid window into perpetuity. And if you give up waiting for me to stop and log out, I offline you. I shouldn't have to explain the potential this has for griefing. Now let me paint a picture in your mind. Imagine a noob in a sandstone base being raided by the alphas who have a big fortified base. See, no, 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 you can raid us back since we're online, so it's fair. Raid you with what? Okay, pause. Quick question. Zoom out. Who do you think benefits the most from dynamic building damage in this situation? And this doubles as an IQ test, so please take your time. Chew on it. Don't rush to any conclusions. Just think it over. The issue we're dealing with here is relative risk. Anyone who is online can be raided, but is everybody equally likely to be raided? Even if the alphas only have a single farmer online, with a gigantic, fully fortified, potentially unraidable god bubble protected base, how in danger of being wiped are they really compared to the group who started yesterday and was living out of a cube? Dynamic building damage doesn't put them in any real danger at all, while it puts everybody else in measurably more danger, which means it'll be open season against noobs and anybody that isn't already established on a server. And if you think that won't happen, I'm gonna remind you, this game is literally filled with losers that spend 80 hours a week ganking naked players and raiding sandstone bases. Giving these people the ability to raid anybody who logs in whenever they're online will absolutely 100% result in these clans not just ganking new players, but wiping them and pushing them off servers more easily than ever before. Plus, you're tying your chances of being raided to logging in, which poses another problem. Do we really want to discourage people from logging in? Sure, you could log in late and maybe get some farming in, but is it worth potentially getting wiped for it? Especially since you're competing with the unemployed dregs of society that are no doubt just waiting for you to log in. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's come across a so-called alpha filled with people that literally never log out. The servers are struggling enough as it is. I really don't think we need to be punishing people for logging in. And to further make the point, let's look at Rust. Rust has 24-7 rating where being offline is almost guaranteed. Same with Ark. And yet both games have much healthier player bases with Rust maintaining well over 100,000 concurrent players at almost all times. Part of this is because Rust is a very front-loaded experience, so starting over can be very enjoyable, but it's also because Rust was designed from the ground up to be a PvP game. The servers wipe regularly, so when you start on a server, you're not having to defend against somebody with a 5-year head start who's bored and needs something to blow up. Plus, getting some meaningful protection doesn't take very long. You can get a very simple 2x1 or a 2x2 built in no time. And once you've got metal doors, the amount of effort it takes to raid you becomes much higher. You're not unraidable, obviously, but the point is you can obtain meaningful levels of protection in very little time, and you can be reasonably sure that your competition won't have the means to raid you yet, because everybody starts at the same time. Now take a look at Conan. The servers don't wipe, so when you join a server, you're competing against clans that have had a long time to stockpile explosives, gods, weapons, gear, and so on. Sometimes years worth of supplies and obtaining real protection takes a ton of time. Sandstone barely protects your stuff at all. A wall only takes two bombs to get past, and even a solo player can farm up hundreds in an evening. Meaning that the entire time you're grinding and leveling and gearing up, 
you have virtually no protection from even the slightest of raids. And because you have no real protection from raids, farming up the materials to build an actual base is impossible. A real tier 3 base can take sometimes thousands of building pieces. Where do you craft all that if you're living in a perma-rated sandstone cube? Where do you keep your stuff? How do you stockpile supplies safely? You're going to be getting raided 24-7 because what's stopping anybody from just robbing you when they feel like it? Conan has a much more punishing and lengthy early game than most games, and the amount of raw hours it takes to reach viability is something I've already spoken about at length in this video. Dynamic building damage makes you raidable for that entire time. And of course, the smaller your team, the longer that early game is because you've got fewer hands to spread the farm around. Longer still if you're guarding each other while you farm, which you may have to do against horses. A full clan of 10 can be set up in no time, but smaller clans are going to have to fend off entrenched clans the entire time they're getting set up, which is to say you're fighting against fully buffed opponents with best in slot gear on horseback with fully level Teemo thrills and forasic weapons while you're in a loincloth and your base takes two bombs to break into. And even if you think you can do that, and you can't, the minute you leave your base to farm, someone's gonna swoop in and rob you. And you're gonna be enjoying this part of the gameplay for days and days if you're in a small group because it takes so long for you to get situated. So now I know what you're thinking. Hmm. Having to compete against potentially infinite resources and manpower when your base only takes two bombs to get inside and you only got some stone tools sounds kind of impossible. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And remember how we talked about how people could just log out to avoid being raided? If you live in a sandstone base, that doesn't really apply, does it? Since it'll only take a few minutes to wipe the entire structure. So basically, established clans with real bases become unraidable all week, while smaller and newer clans just eat shit. This game does not need to be harder to get into, I promise you that. And if that wasn't bad enough, consider how potentially exploitable this system is. I've got a spare account, I've got lots of spare accounts. Let's say I logged into one of those accounts and build a wall around my main account's base and then just never log in with that alternate account. Now nobody can reach my base and I can't be raided. Yeah, you could say that, well, Funcom's gonna ban you for that. But it takes two months just to get my Funcom ID changed. And even video reports of flagrant hacking can sometimes take weeks to process. They can barely police the servers as it is. Having yet another set of rules that have to be investigated and parsed out individually is gonna be a nightmare. And that's just an obvious case of exploiting the system. What if I keep my stuff inside an alternate account's base? How would anybody prove that that alt is mine? How would anybody know that it has my stuff? I could keep stuff safe forever in an alternate account and nobody would ever even know. What if I built a base nearby that blocks traffic from the obelisk to make raiding me harder, but it looks like a legitimate base? How does anybody know? How could they possibly investigate that? Is it really a good idea to add all of this investigative work for the moderators? But no, we're not done yet. On PvE servers, there's an issue of people building big, fat, ugly, laggy bases and then only logging in to refresh their decay timer for years at a time. At least on PvP servers, if someone's in a spot we want, we can raid them. With dynamic building damage though, that's five days out of the week you can't even try. And now they only have to farm up one bubble to stop you foundation wiping it on the weekend. A problem previously unique to PvE servers becomes an ever-present issue on PvP servers. Uh, wait a second, speaking of bubbles, let's say you play a lot. As it is now, bubbles last 36 hours, so if you pop the bubble just before raid window one day, it'll cover two days worth of raid windows. But if you're playing consistently, and can be raided at any time and want full bubble upkeep, you need to farm a new bubble every 36 hours instead of once every two days. So a mechanic that is already grindy enough to burn players out becomes even grindier, further discouraging people from logging in. Plus, if you ever have a lapse in your coverage, if you leave to farm a new bubble, you could get godded before you can even replace that bubble. Of course, 10 men clans are hardly even going to notice that cost increase. Your small group of friends who work for a living absolutely will though. Unless, of course, you change your playstyle to only log in when you can stretch your bubble coverage, robbing you of potential playtime. Once again, great for big clans, bad for everybody else. Another wonderful idea. But I think you get the idea. It's a system that would further exacerbate Conan's painful early game, make smaller clans consistently vulnerable, give a flat advantage to large clans at the expense of smaller clans, indirectly increase the cost of god protection in a way that is overly punishing for small groups, while opening the door for all kinds of exploits and moderation headaches, and after all that, depending on the grace period, it'll either make every established clan unraidable during the week, or completely fail to do what it was supposed to do in the first place. Which brings us to the final nail in the coffin. This entire conversation is stemming from the fact that we're trying to make being offline impossible. But should we?
Now, I try my best to raid people when they're online. I really do. I try to pick weekend days when people are most likely to be there, and if I can, I'll even reschedule a raid if they're not home, when I'm able to. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. If I'm a solo player and I show up to your base with a god coin and you're not home, I mean, it's got a timer on it. I'm not going to throw that away and farm another tomorrow. It is what it is, right? If I've got a large raid base and a treb tower built, I'm not going to leave that till tomorrow and awkwardly sit in it while you set up explosives to instantly blow it up the next day. That would just be stupid. But obviously, even in those cases, I'd still prefer if they were online. Online raids in Conan are some of the best experiences you can get in a video game. But what about situations where you have to offline somebody? We've talked in this very video about bases that are literally unraidable if they have people inside due to their exploiting of the raid mechanics. If you've got a hanging base inside Deserter's Gutter, or a properly built keyhole base and there's a bubble on it, your only hope of raiding it is with an offline. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's experienced this either, but let's say you've got a group of undermeshers, hackers, or exploiters on your server. People that are using speed hacks and range hacks to kill you through walls from across the map with a base that can't be traditionally raided. Is it really wrong to offline something like that? Should we be making an offline raid impossible in that scenario? What about solos and small groups trying to fight against a large clan? If you can't even chip away at the Alpha Clan's power without their consent, you're basically boxing a huge portion of the community out of the raid mechanic altogether, because clans of 2 or 3 will have zero chance online raiding a clan of 10 with a 5 year head start and an unraidable base. Do they really need more protection? Now let's consider that that large clan might be toxic. Let's say they raid sandstone all day and throw slurs around and kill off every server they're on. They only play the game to kill servers. Are we really gonna say that unless you can 3v10 them, you just have to let them kill your server? You can't even touch their slave wheels unless they're online and able to react? Sure, with all those cases, you might catch them on the weekend with dynamic building damage, but if they only have to watch their base two days out of the week, the chances are pretty slim. The way I see it, at the end of the day, you're on a PvP server. Raid windows aren't perfect, but they're an important quality of life feature that makes the game playable. Without those grace periods allowing new players to farm and build without the constant threat of wipes, nobody hits the end game. And unlike Rust, which has a really enjoyable early game, Conan is all about the end game. People have to be able to progress, and raid windows ensure that happens. It's the only game feature that mitigates the game's other bad design choices. The building in raid systems aren't designed for constant threats. Without specific posted times for people to plan their raids around, attacking bases can be impossible. Even just look at some of the raids I've done on this tiny channel. Bases that I couldn't have even attacked since the owners log in so infrequently. Land claim that couldn't be cleared because the owners don't play anymore. Bases that couldn't be robbed even though they were fully abandoned. My favorite raid ever would have been cut so short since one of the clans we raided that night wasn't online when we got there. It wasn't planned that way, we would have preferred if they were there, obviously, and the base was still actively defended by their allies, but we would have had to take our stolen coin and throw it away out of spite. Basically, the more restrictions you put on the raid system, the harder it is to get those really standout examples of emergent gameplay. And I get it. I don't like being offline either, but I promise you guys, dynamic building damage is not the solution. We shouldn't be trying to make offlining impossible. Close the gap between the early and the late game and streamline the grind so people are more likely to have a good time before they get raided and rebuilding after a raid doesn't take so long. But even with all of that, at the end of the day, it is what it is. Sometimes you get wiped. It comes with the territory and you knew what you signed up for. Conan isn't a game where you can play it casually on your own time and have everybody conform to your schedule. There's no way to make that work, and even if you try, you're only going to make the game worse. That's not to say that I think the raid windows are perfect. As it is, it requires you to be online 35 hours a week, which is a lot for any game. Instead of some complicated system to fix it, why not just shrink the raid windows down to 2 hours or so during the week and have longer windows on the weekend? It's still plenty of time to perform a decent raid attempt on most bases. Maybe we can experiment with having a few days out of the week not have raid windows at all. Maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays can just be farm days. That way you don't have the pressure of being online every single day. It's not a perfect solution, but I'll take that over dynamic building damage any day. And so we've finally made it to the building section. I've intentionally left this for the end and kept it separate from the rest of the video for a few very simple reasons. Firstly, it's a complicated issue and we have to set up a lot of context before we can get anywhere with it. And if you don't have a decent understanding of the rest of the game's problems, you can't even really begin to approach the building problem. But I'll be honest with you guys. While I'm almost 100% confident that nearly everything else I've suggested in this video would be an objective improvement for the game, I'm not as confident here and my tone will reflect that. And before we get into it, 
I'm just going to say that for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to assume that fence stacking is off the table. So it might come as a surprise for some of you, but we're not going to ask to bring that back. We do need to talk about it for context though. So just to be abundantly clear, I'm not asking for the return of fence stacking. We're only going to cover it for the sake of context. And so with that, let's get into it. Let's start with a crash course on where the meta is currently at. Bases tend to fall into three categories. Cave bases, pillar bases, and freestanding bases. Cave bases are, as the name indicates, built within caves and use the natural terrain to force attackers into spending large amounts of resources to get to the core from a given direction, typically through only a few restricted entryways, since the surrounding terrain is unbreakable. These are typically the most expensive to raid. Pillar bases use verticality. Instead of horizontal honeycombing through walls and layers, they use anti-climb, which for all intents and purposes can be loosely described as vertical honeycombing since you'll need to break every single layer to reach the core, which is at the top. It's not a perfect comparison though, since honeycombing the actual core at the top can be very difficult, so if somebody doesn't want to loot the base and just wants to cause damage, it can be considerably cheaper than raiding most other kinds of bases. Although defending a pillar base can be considered easier since preventing people from climbing if they are trying to loot the base is much easier than preventing people from walking into a raided cave base. The final category of freestanding base is a catch-all term for any base that isn't designed to utilize a piece of terrain. So this is everything from a castle built into the middle of the desert, or a rat's nest on flat ground, and so on and so forth. These can be some of the most expensive to build and are often the weakest, since you'll be required to honeycomb in every direction, which multiplies the cost of building considerably and limits how many layers you can feasibly build before you either can't afford to expand, or that area of the map becomes unusably laggy. Though the type of freestanding base largely dictates how viable it is at protecting loot and how defensible it is in a raid, so this is the kind of base that varies the most. Naturally, any base built around its terrain will be greatly influenced by it. A pillar base at H5, for example, will be cheap and effective, since it's a tall, thin pillar. A pillar base at Heliograph Heights, while tall, will be considerably more expensive due to the width of the pillar. Similarly, a cave base in the Eastern Barracks will be considerably cheaper to build than the fully honeycombing the crevice. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to be lumping in cave bases with bases built within structures into the same category. Though it's important to note that there are some major differences in how these two base types operate. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of the kinds of bases you can find, and we're not going to get into the finer details of every base type. We just need to distill it down to the important details. One. Equally viable bases with similar raid costs can vary in construction costs by hundreds or even thousands of building pieces. Two, even bases within the same category can vary in costs by thousands of building pieces. Three, because the viability of a base location is often determined by its cost, the best base locations, such as the keyhole, generally require the smallest amount of building pieces. And four, perhaps most importantly, while honeycombing is in every case loosely defined as health in the way of your stuff, it's utilized in very different ways depending on the base, so boiling down a formula for how many bombs a building piece should take in every case is functionally impossible. This is why Rust can have an upkeep system and Conan can't. Rust bases are all basically freestanding bases. You can reasonably quantify how many building pieces your average base will take up, and raids can be entirely planned around the materials you use. Conan bases can vary by location, type, thousands of building pieces, choke points, thrall counts, and so on. So assigning a cost to any base in a way that is fair would be impossible. I would further deconstruct the idea of an upkeep system for Conan because it's a really stupid idea, but it's also currently not on the table. If it ever is, I'll put out a 30 minute video explaining in detail why it would be an extremely stupid idea. For clarity's sake, nothing that we've talked about so far is necessarily a problem, and I'm not implying any negative connotations to these points. I vastly prefer Conan's building system to Rust, and the variety allows for it is part of why I really love this game. My most memorable moments in Conan couldn't have happened with a simpler building system, so again, all we're doing right now is establishing context. The next thing we need to consider is the spatial economy, or more specifically, the artificial spatial economy created by the economy update. We're going to be glossing over a lot so we can stay on task. Suffice it to say, I had a lot of negative things to say about the economy update, and that has largely remained unchanged. But here's a quick summary. When this update went live, a host of new crafting benches were added to the game that were considerably larger than what was already in the game, and crafting power was shifted from thralls to benches. When pressed for an explanation, the developers stated that they were looking to experiment with balancing around a spatial economy, which always struck me as a little tone deaf from a PvP perspective. Firstly, the game already had a spatial economy. 
larger, more easily defensible base locations already held value. And the more space your clan could command, the more benches you could fit, the more honeycombing you could build, and the more thralls you could place for defense, giving you better crafting speeds overall and better defense in exchange for being much easier to find and usually being more expensive. Smaller base locations would sacrifice on the number and type of benches they could fit, as well as how much honeycombing and thrall defense they could afford in exchange for stealth and secrecy. So there was already a real trade-off that went along with base size. Unfortunately, the only bases that were negatively affected by the new spatial economy were the same ones being negatively affected by the old one. Now, smaller bases not only sacrifice the number of benches they can hold, but because cost reductions are applied by the type of bench rather than the tier of thrall associated with the bench, whatever benches you could fit into your tiny base are artificially less effective. Fitting these new high tier benches into even the most moderately sized base locations can be extremely difficult, and the larger the core of your base is, the larger its perimeter. So this one simple change would either exponentially increase the cost of your honeycombing, or prevent you from being able to craft efficiently, meaning smaller clans would have to farm extra to compensate for the use of less efficient benches. Meanwhile, clans that could already demand better base locations experienced no loss of efficiency, so any clan with a base large enough for the fully upgraded benches was essentially receiving a flat increase to their crafting efficiency across the board, while smaller clans received a penalty with no real trade-off or good explanation. Smaller clans can't really do anything about it either, since if they had the manpower to demand the best base locations in the first place, they'd already have them. Not to mention that servers never wipe, so you're never competing for fresh open map space. You're moving into an occupied map every time you start a new playthrough, so the chances of getting lucky and getting a decent base location become even worse. The economy update acted as yet another direct buff to large established clan play, and a direct nerf to solos and smaller clans. One of many, many features to do so in this video, and something that the game definitely didn't need. But we're not here to do a deep dive on the economy update. We're here to talk about the current state of the building meta and its problems. So here are the relevant takeaways. 1. After the economy update, the cores of most bases are larger due to bigger benches, and bases without upgraded benches will have a loss of efficiency. 2. The larger the core of a base is, the harder it is to honeycomb. If you're built in a cave, for example, and you expand your core, you're using up space that could be used for honeycombing, and you've only got so much cave space for efficient layering before you run out. There's more that could be said here, but we're just taking the relevant information so we can move on to the next bit of context. The hot topic of the day, fence stacking, or more accurately, its removal. Fence stacking, as it's called, was featured in my building tutorial, and it was considered legal for the first five years of the game's life. Essentially, by using the right combinations of square and wedge foundations, you could offset fence foundations to place them very tightly together. Additionally, bombs cannot be placed on erased fence foundations, so by placing your doors a few foundations up, attackers would need to blast through the much sturdier fence foundations if they wanted to use bombs, though they could still use explosive arrows to more cheaply raid through the doors directly, which would allow you to repair them and stall the raid. While on its surface it can sound overpowered, in practice it actually helped to alleviate an imbalance in the rating system. Namely that bombs are so easy to obtain compared to how long it takes to build a base, even thoroughly honeycombed bases don't take more than a few hundred bombs to raid, while even a solo player with good tools can farm hundreds of bombs in an evening. Not to mention the god mechanic is completely separate, so even if you farm extensively to make a fully honeycombed base, you still have to farm up a bubble every other day or else it's all for nothing, making the entire system feel redundant and kind of pointless. Fence stacking wasn't just spatially efficient for caves either, they also allowed you to make the most of your space anywhere. It introduced a consideration for pillar bases where you could choose a thicker pillar that would be more expensive to anti-climb, but the trade-off would be better wall honeycombing to protect against trebuchets, a major concern for pillar bases. It also alleviated the cost of expanding horizontally for freestanding bases by allowing you to make the most out of every foundation's worth of expansion you needed. And combining these techniques allowed for otherwise unviable building locations to achieve respectable performance. Obviously, there's a lot to consider here, but recently, Funcom changed their tune on fence stacking, citing the potential for lag, exploits, and crashes from having so many building pieces so close together, so the feature has since been removed. I would just like to point out a few things though. Firstly, while fence stacking has since been removed, ceiling stacking still works. I'm assuming it's also against the rules now, but it's kinda weird that this was missed. Pillar stacking is still very possible, which involves manually placing pillars closely together between normal honeycombing. So instead of having four or five fence foundations in any given space, you have two fence foundations and nine pillars, 11 pieces in total, a net increase in pieces. Additionally, by making honeycombing less spatially efficient, the amount of building pieces required to achieve the same level of health is actually much higher. I bumped into this problem during my last playthrough with Jumbie. 
We had built our base inside a structure, but very quickly we ran out of structure to build in. And once it was time to honeycomb anything on the exterior, we needed to honeycomb in every direction. So for each layer of protection, we'd need to use considerably more building pieces compared to fence stacking, which made it very laggy very quickly. All this to say that if the goal was to reduce the number of building pieces in a given location, I'm not sure that will be achieved, since bases will need exponentially more building pieces to achieve the same level of health as before. Additionally, fence stacking allowed players to work around the long-standing issue of how worthless doors are for base defense. While tier 3 fence foundations have 90,000 health, doors only have 25,000. So the quality of your defense is often measured by how many doors you have. Fence stacking allowed you to fit more doors into a smaller space, and forced attackers to bomb through foundations instead of the doors if they didn't want to use arrows to raid cheaply, which greatly increased the cost of a raid. Though even a heavily stacked door tunnel is still pretty easy to raid for most groups. It just helped to alleviate that disparity. Without fence stacking, it's harder to realistically increase the amount of doors you have on any given base, and because you can no longer prevent the placement of bombs, bombing your way through doors will always be possible meaning that raids will be both cheaper and easier to perform in a raid economy that players already believe favors attackers. Once again, there's a lot of debate here, but just put it aside for now, we'll come back to it. The entire conversation gets a lot more complicated with the recently added ability to pick up buildings that are at full health. Players are now opting to not have doors at all, and instead replace them with walls when necessary while taking their loot and hiding it under building pieces and inside their honeycomb. Presumably, this was a feature added to make building easier for PvE and roleplay communities, and it could have worked just fine for PvP. Rust has a feature that allows you to demolish structures you place for a short time after placing it. I don't see why this couldn't have been implemented for Conan. I'm assuming the feature was added so that if you were building a complicated roleplay structure and misclicked, you could pick up the piece at no penalty. If there was a time limit added to this function, you could still have this functionality without all of the unintended PvP side effects. And yes, technically, you could always do this. It was always possible to build a base without doors and use a few in-game mechanics to move loot around, and it was always possible to stash your loot under ceiling tiles within your honeycombing and so on. It was possible, but it wasn't free, and that's the issue. I even mentioned in my second building video the secret of building a base with no doors, and I modeled that location after an actual base I'd built on a live server once. The only way to get out of the base was with midnight potions, and loot could only be transported inside using thralls. If I needed an emergency exit or entrance, I'd have to rip out building pieces and pay to replace them. I was actually pretty impressed with the performance of this base, but I almost never built this way again for one simple reason. It's a gigantic pain in the ass. And it should be. And while doors might be too weak, that weakness enables the entirety of the raiding system. Bases have to be designed around realistic entrances. Defenders can plan their entire raid defense around their entrances, and attackers can plan their assaults around it as well. Either they limit their attack angles by going through the doors, or they pay the extra cost to open a safer entrance through the walls. Players can get creative with where and how they place their entrances, and bases naturally extend from that. If players want to have the added defense of a base with no doors, they should have to inconvenience themselves in some way. Allowing them to have all the positives with none of the negatives makes balancing the current raid scheme almost impossible. If players can just replace their doors with walls, suddenly the cost of a raid is multiplied by four or more, since without an obvious entrance, you could waste a lot of explosives. And while it may be the case that in some situations, raiding is too easy, if raiding becomes too expensive, you risk pricing out large portions of the player base from this crucial mechanic, and if players can't raid, they lose out on a major reason to play the game. Servers stagnate, and we're back to square one. The easiest way to fix this is to just disable pickup on PvP servers. There's no reason for it to be there. This and health bars. They're already server options. I can't see why we don't just disable them beyond maybe pride, but every day that we leave features like that alone, in the hopes that eight months down the line we'll have a fix, the game feels that much worse for that much longer. But now that we've covered all of that, we've got a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with, which begs the question, what's actually wrong with the building system? Well, the complaints come from two major camps. The first believes that raid defense is too easy and that certain game mechanics can make online raiding somebody basically impossible. And the other believes that raids are too cheap and too easy to perform. It's seemingly contradictory, but the troubling part is that they're both kind of right. Even ignoring the unraidable base designs we've already talked about, it's possible to place building pieces through walls, and repairing a structure before it's been fully broken is pretty easy in most cases. Meaning it's actually really easy for an active defender with enough spare supplies to sit in the core of their base and just spam place structures to trap enemy attackers and infinitely increase the cost of a raid. And there's not really a response to this beyond trying to body block any breach that you make. 
for a lot of clans, if you don't have an overwhelming advantage, like for example your clan of 10 raiding a clan of 2, then you're not going to be able to break the stalemate. And if the defenders entomb you with a bunch of building spam, even if it's just sandstone, if you're not carrying enough bombs to blast out, you have to kill yourself to get unstuck. On the other side of the issue, defenders are finding it really hard to build a base that actually protects their stuff. If you're not rebuilding and spamming building pieces in a raid, it's really not that hard, or at least not that expensive, to blast through even really thick honeycombing. My base in the solo playthrough shows that, even with a considerable 20 plus layers of tightly packed fence stacking, pretty much anybody who wanted a piece was able to waltz right in, because the cost of raiding through doors is a joke, and most clans can farm up the bombs to blast through any amount of honeycombing in no time at all. Even as a solo player, I can farm up hundreds of bombs in an evening. It already kind of felt like a joke, but now you've got the economy update encouraging larger cores and fence stacking has been removed, which by itself nerfs the amount of honeycombing you can have by many, many layers, so building a base that takes more than maybe 10 minutes to blast through feels impossible. Especially once you start to throw 10-man server-hopping clans into the mix with infinite raid materials. That's not even mentioning the tax of having to maintain bubble coverage on top of everything you're farming your ass off for a base that doesn't actually give you much survivability. So, uh... In case you haven't yet grasped the difficulty of our task, allow me to rephrase this. In a system where bases vary by thousands of building pieces, can reliably become unraidable with the right setup, employ wildly different defensive strategies, and can vary in raid costs by hundreds or thousands of explosives depending on whether or not the occupants decide to use doors, we have to solve the problem of bases being both simultaneously too hard and too easy to raid, while taking into account the fact that buildings can be placed without line of sight, players have built-in ESP, Clans are allowed to take up 25% of a server's maximum occupancy. Gods operate completely separately from the building mechanic. The farming rates don't facilitate gameplay. Clans can transfer in with essentially infinite resources. Defenders can at any time pick up all their things and transfer out. Hidden player lists and newer mechanics rob you of player interaction that makes all of the build up and payoff worth it. Nearly every macro mechanic directly favors large groups to a degree that makes balancing impossible. And every other game mechanic runs directly contrary to a decent PvP experience and basically guarantees your time on the server will be wasted. Remember how I said at the beginning of this section that I was a lot less confident here and how I keep saying Conan isn't really designed for PvP? Yeah. But we're gonna try anyways, because I don't actually think the situation is hopeless. And really, we're not aiming to make things perfect. If we can just make it playable enough for people to enjoy it despite its flaws, that's a much more attainable goal. So let's start with the defensive side, or the feeling of, I spent all this time on my base and it didn't count for shit. We've already talked about a number of issues that can passively help alleviate this. Limiting clan sizes and preventing item transfers immediately takes the impossibility out of base defense, and doubling the farming rates, which is something you absolutely have to do, reduces the grind necessary to get a base. Reducing that time investment is a huge part of solving the problem. It was mentioned somewhere that the developers were open to considering a rebalance on the health of building pieces to compensate for the loss of fence tech. But I have some reservations. The whole reason drawbridges can render a base unraidable is because if a single building piece has too much health to be broken in a single explosion, it can be repaired indefinitely. That's the entire problem. And while it is much harder to plug an entryway with regular non-gate sized building pieces, any adjustment to building health has the potential to create that problem to a lesser degree with any other piece. Plus, there's so many different kinds of bases using building pieces in so many different ways, and it's still possible to place structures without line of sight. Finding the perfect health for each building piece so that we don't cause all kinds of problems is going to be impossible. So, in my possibly controversial opinion, that's a whole can of worms that shouldn't even be opened unless it's absolutely necessary. The only building pieces that should have their health adjusted are doors and gates, for obvious reasons. It was once possible to stack three or four doors into a single foundation space, and that still counted for very little. We still need to be careful with buffs for the reasons I already stated, but I think 60,000 health is a safe number for doors and 80,000 for gates. In almost every situation, that's plenty low enough to be blasted in a single explosion while being high enough to still give real increase in defense abilities. Plus, that kind of health means that by destroying doors, you're considerably damaging everything else anyways, so once a large breach is made, it'll be that much harder for defenders to just cheese it by plugging up the breach forever. It's gonna be a win-win on both sides. Fence stacking was at least limited by its terrain, though, and doors can be placed anywhere at any time. 
So if their health is too high, it can become equally oppressive. So I would just keep an eye on it in the future. It goes without saying that the cost of doors and gates should be raised as well to compensate. The health shouldn't be for free. The cost of vaults should be doubled to match the doubled farming rates, meaning they'll be just as attainable in the future as they are now. I love vault spam in my bases. I love my rat's nests and my drop sites and so on, but vaults as a mechanic can be really annoying to deal with. There's nothing wrong with using them, but we don't want vault spam to be any easier. Doubling the farming rates while making vaults more expensive will naturally encourage people to build normal bases, which is what everyone enjoys attacking and defending the most anyways. As for the explosives to building piece ratio issue, you can't just nerf bomb damage because you'll wind up with the same issue you get from buffing building health too far. You'll make removing certain structures impossible and raids become a nightmare. Essentially every building piece can operate like a drawbridge and you'll never be able to blast it. It is true that farming explosives is way too easy though compared to the time it takes to build a reasonable base, but you have to mitigate that through cost. If the gathering rates are doubled, which makes all of this a lot easier, the cost of dragon powder should either be doubled or increased by 50%. At the moment, I think the rate at which people gather bombs is actually okay, it's really the time that it takes to get a base that's disproportionately high. So making bases two times easier to farm without making bombs that much easier to farm proportionally would help to solve the problem, even if it might seem a little lopsided. And you might think that doubling the farming rate while keeping bomb farming the same speed would mean that bombs are half as effective as before, but I don't think that's the case, and I'm hinging that belief on the fact that there's sort of a hard limit to how large bases can reasonably be. Keyword reasonably. You can only add so much anti-climb to a pillar base before you run out of pillar. And you can only cheaply add so many layers to a cave base before you run out of cave, right? Once the terrain is no longer assisting you, the cost to expand becomes exponential. And back in the day, the rates were already doubled, and when they were cut in half just before SIPTA launched, bases didn't really get any smaller. They just took twice as long to build. Players still needed that health, and ultimately people want to play the game. Typically, people will build up to a point and then go on the offensive. Of course, I could be proven wrong, and doubling the rates could result in massive bases, even though it didn't before. But honestly, some of my best moments in this game come from raiding large bases, so I'm not sure if I even see that as a problem, really. And yes, we will be talking about the bans for large bases soon. On the offensive side of things, the only real problem so far is the unraidable bases, and we already talked about drawbridges and kind of dealt with hanging bases. Unfortunately, the only real fix for building spam during a raid is to require line of sight for placing structures. I don't know how easy or possible that even is to implement, but it's kind of the only thing that would fix that. The change Changes to the rate at which people can farm bombs might feel a bit slow if bases do wind up becoming too large, but in my experience, bombs have always been the easiest part of raid farming. The real time sink is all the epic flawless gear, the thralls, the materials for raid bases, and so on, all of which will benefit from the increased rates, and should help to cancel out that grindy feeling without making the bomb to building ratio into a fat joke. This should also hopefully subtly encourage more online raids, since that's the real heart of the bomb to building ratio problem. In an active raid, it's anybody's guess how many bombs a base will take. It's really only offline raids where you can calculate precisely how many bombs you need. That's where buildings are at their most useless, and right now bombs are the easiest part of the equation to farm, so of course that's going to result in a lot of offline raids. People are encouraged to offline now because building through walls and unraidable choke points make raiding really annoying, plus the extra farming necessary to get everything else you need for an online attempt takes up an unreasonable amount of time. Fixing all these problems makes an online raid considerably more approachable. We're never going to make offlining disappear, but it puts online raids on the table for clans that would otherwise be priced out of it by the time investment required, which is better for everybody. Additionally, I think we need to see a general shift away from just explosives towards more siege play. I always complained about this strength of trebuchets way back in the day. Because back then you could build a trebuchet in 5 minutes, and stone boulders did splash damage, and the damage was so high, anybody who was level 20 and had a pile of rocks in their pockets could level a tier 3 base in no time. But trebuchets have been reworked since then, they take longer to build and are much more vulnerable, they're a real siege tool now instead of a cheese weapon. We should consider adding different ammunition types and maybe take a look at the boulder damage. Maybe add an iron variant of that, that has the old splash damage attached to it. And look, if you just use the model for the stone boulder and just color it gray and call it iron, I mean, I won't tell anyone if you don't. <laughs> it's just something to consider. Well, sieges are so much more fun than just walking up to a base and dropping bombs. Some of you may be surprised to see that I didn't recommend more buffs to the defensive side of things, but if bases become too expensive to raid, and raids as a result never happen, servers wind up dying just as they do now. It's a careful balancing act. 
If anything, I want raids to be happening more often, whether they fail or not, which is why most of this advice is designed to grease the wheels, so to speak. Let people farm up their bases quickly. Let raiders get their gear and buffs and so on. Get people to a point where they can play and enjoy themselves while dealing with the major problems like door health and unraidable bases. Basically, to summarize the point for this section, most of the problems with the raid scheme are coming from elsewhere in the game, and dealing with those problems first will naturally deal with a lot of the raid problems. Again, raids are the best part of playing Conan, both offensively and defensively. Seeing your base perform well in a raid, defending it valiantly and getting wiped, rebuilding and striking back, it's the major draw of the game. We just need to make sure that more people get to see it. When things come together, it can be something really amazing. There's nothing quite like a Conan war with big bases and big raids. Which, unfortunately, Brings us to our final point. Funcom, you guys have got to take it easy with the bans. And I'm not talking about admirals for anybody curious. These guys were foundation claiming building spots, which is explicitly against the rules and there's no real gameplay mechanic to answer that. They had suspicious undermesh drawbridges and land claim all over the place. They knew what they were doing and they had it coming. The timing on the ban really sucked, I'm not gonna lie, but I'm not upset that they got banned. No, I'm not talking about admirals. I'm talking about the 30 threads a day I'm seeing on the Reddit and the forums and the PMs I'm getting and the Steam discussions of people getting banned just for having a large base. And it sucks because for years we've been begging for moderation, but it was always for exploiters and hackers. Funcom has a tendency to be like the monkey's paw though. They'll grant you your wish, but it's always with a catch. And to their credit, yes, they've gotten a lot better at banning hackers and so on. And they did finally clarify the building restrictions this time. Kind of. I took a look at it and yeah, for the most part, this should all be bannable. Random land claim that serves no purpose, gigantic laggy walls that only exist for aesthetics, sandstone claim webs that cover entire grid spaces, which are already mildly infamous on my channel. Bridges and roads, sure, I mean they're big, they're laggy, they're not really necessary, that's fair enough. A lot of these rules are important, especially on PvE servers where there's truly no way to remove land claims, so large bases make servers unplayable forever. But then I get to this screenshot and it all starts to unravel. If this counts as a bannably large structure, then we're all doomed. <laughs> You've got considerably larger bases in the advertisements for this game. I get having the restriction on PvE servers, but we have to loosen up on PvP. Not only does it seem kind of unfair to be banning people for building large bases, when the removal of fence stacking and the economy update both seem to be forcing people into building larger bases, especially since every clan has to build up against 10-man server invasions with potentially immeasurable resources, but even outside of the raw necessity. Big bases are just fun. They're fun to have. They're fun to raid. Every time I see a big fat base, my inner murder hobo instincts trigger and I just want to try and get inside. My best playthroughs ever involve raiding huge bases all over the map. Something about running up and down colossal walls and planning gigantic sieges, it's the best part about this game. And let's face it, even with a land claim issue, sometimes you have to claim a little bit of land. I mean, if you have a pillar base, and there's a pillar right next to that pillar base, and you don't claim it, that's suicide on your part. There needs to be some kind of situational allowances for some cases, right? I don't know who is asking for large bases to be a bannable offense, but that needs to be reserved for serious offenders. I mean, look, even on that one playthrough where every major location was owned by a single clan, it still wound up being the most fun playthrough I've ever had in this game. All I'm saying is we have the tools to deal with big bases in PvP. There's no reason for it to be against the rules. I get that it can cause lag, but as long as the official servers are hosted by G-Portal, they're gonna be laggy. There's no way around it. That little mini playthrough I did with Jumbi on 1800 was one of the laggiest servers I've ever been on. Between rubber banding and latency spikes and so on, it was almost unplayable at times, even compared to European servers that should logically be even laggier. And that's with 1800 being barren. There was only one real base on the entire server and it was abandoned. The server still lagged. At this point, I think we all know what we sign up for to a certain degree when we join official servers. Banning large bases is just robbing everybody of a good time. And it goes without saying that this new so-called reportable offense is being abused by bad actors. I've been shown screenshots of people that I know are hackers or play with hackers that are bragging in their discords, saying it's like they've got the moderators on their payroll because all they have to do to grief a server is send in a few reports. Hackers don't even have to put any work in to empty out a server anymore. They just show up and send reports. They don't even need the hacks anymore. Most wars are being decided by who sends in the most reports rather than actual PvP. This is not a good place for the game to be and these are not the kinds of people we should be enabling. Plus, having to set aside time to arbitrarily decide how large bases can be just burdens an already overburdened report system. 
You're making this whole situation so much harder for yourselves than you have to. If it's a PvP server, just focus on exploiters and hackers. That's all we ever really needed. And if somebody builds a castle that spreads across 8 grid spaces, then hey, maybe step in. Just let me try raiding it first, huh? Well, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. I know we covered a lot, but feel free to leave your comments below because I know I left a lot out. Even if only a little bit of this gets implemented, the game will feel a lot better, and if nothing changes and my next playthrough is just as painful as the last one, well, at least I can say I tried, right? Looking forward to hearing your thoughts, guys. Thanks for watching.